you hear You're me? live. Yes. yes. Hi, Elke. Oh, oh no. Oh no, we can't possibly start yet. My coffee is still in the other room. Hold ah. on. Out of coffee fail. We are live. I just saw it. Tell you what, my friends, being out of coffee at 3.30 in the morning Eastern time is, a, is an emotion all by itself. Your, your camera is a little bit blurred, Bastian. That's out of coffee. Morning, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. How are you, Elke? Thanks, fine. <laughs> but it's really morning here. <laughs> yeah. Nice there. So good morning. Hi. Good morning. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Bastian, Elke, and Marian, do you want to use this nice little feature that you can get access and click the slide on your own in case you are presenting? Uh, yes, we will. Yes, we, we, we just tried it yesterday. It works. Do I have to confirm this or do you get the rights automatically? Hold on, let me show you. Click. And the beautiful thing is while, while I do that, you can also do that too. So I can now go to this. It takes a little while, I think. I think I have to allow this in the system settings first. Okay, can you give it a try? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, that is me. We just try. Okay, send the request. Approved. Approved. Good. <clears throat> hmm. Well, it says I'm doing it, but it doesn't work. Oh, oh God. Okay, that was a delay of about, mm. <laughs> no, uh, just another mi click. Okay, yeah, it's better, better now. Okay, so, and I give it up now. Okay. And Marion, it's your turn. But I think you can all keep it, right? Multiple people can keep it. Oh, only one person at a time. Ah, okay, I see. Only one person, we, we verified it yesterday. Okay, whenever there's a request, I will approve it. Glad that, that the man of the hour is here already. <laughs> and he knew that I meant him. I love it. Hello, 
Hello. Another early yeah, we are live band. <laughs> we are already live band. You want Eric, to take the Zoom or into... We also mm -hmm. can hear you. Okay, you have to go to Slack first, and there you will see the link. Okay, I have to give the opening now. If the boss is calling, you better take the you phone. Better call. answer. <laughs> Okay, what do you think? Should we start on time and be punctual Germans or should we take <laughs> more minutes until more people join? And, and Depends on how many minutes Rick needs. Uh, I should come in right around an hour, so uh, I, can, I can speed up or slow down if, if, you, uh, if you need me to. Okay, then I would suggest we wait two or three more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I, I can be deadline driven. How many people do we already have? Some 19 participants in the Zoom and we have five people watching on YouTube and concurrently. Hello, YouTubers. How's it going? I think more people are joining. Hello, nice to see you. Stefan, I, I may have a question before we start. It's about the sessions. Do we know how much time is allocated to each paper? That's a good question. Um, there are no fixed rules for this. Um, the main idea is that the um, presenters will quickly summarize their paper in a few minutes, I would say between one and three minutes, they should be able to summarize it. And then the discussion starts. And then um, it's the job of the session chair to keep an eye on the clock and to see whether there are lively discussions and we need a little bit more time or whether Stefan, I, I may have the next paper. before we start it's about the session. Okay, it means that the presenter has, is using, for instance, the teaser to present uh, his or her work. And then what's the role of the discussion? He's uh, asking question or only if nobody is asking question in the room? The discussion is the first person to ask the questions. He or she has hopefully prepared some questions and initiates the discussion. And then you can also hand over to other people in the audience. OK, thanks. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. No, perfectly fine. I mean, we can use the time and chat a little bit. Okay, I guess we start, right? Let's. Okay, welcome everyone to the 32nd IEEE International Conference on Software Engineering, Education and Training. 
which um, happens to be in Munich, but not really in Munich because we are meeting virtually here in Zoom and you probably listen to us over YouTube as well. Um, we had an interesting planning of this conference. We first tried to plan it um, in Munich in July locally, but then um, as you all know, a couple of bad news um, hit our year 2020 and we had to organize it virtually. But I think we found the perfect week. I think this is the best week of the year yet. We have a new president soon in the US, which will hopefully follow science a little bit better now. Um, we have the news that there will be a vaccine in the near future that um, might end the pandemic. And this conference takes place. Isn't that amazing? It's, I, I think it's the best week in the year. Um, That's absolutely right. <laughs> and this is um, the main organizing team. So um, this conference is introduced to, uh, to you by the program chairs, Elke and Marian, and the general chairs, Bastian, Bernd and me. And Bastian and me, we will start with a couple of um, introductions, slides, and then we will hand over to Elke and Marian, which will tell you a little bit more about the program. So let's start with Bastian and me. Um, first of all, the general theme and the objectives of the conference. Our general theme was to educate for the future. So we wanted to seek new ideas, new technologies. Um, we wanted to identify the current challenges for the current generation. The current generation is um, coming from the digital age. They all start their school career with being used to technology, with being used to smartphones, tablets, and computers. And this is our main aim for this conference that we want to find ways how we can educate the future generation. The idea for the conference is that it should be a highly interactive atmosphere. So we try to um, reduce the number of presentation minutes um, by actually flipping the conference. So um, some of you might have heard of a flipped classroom where the students do not listen to the presentation, but they are basically doing exercises and discussing things in the classroom. And the main, this is also the main idea of this conference. So for all the paper sessions, um, the authors uploaded the videos to YouTube. So we have 45 videos on YouTube that you can watch before the presentation starts, before the session starts. And then you can use the time during the session to discuss the ideas in the paper and to network and to get together and to find out about all the details that you are interested in. We have a virtual conference, um, which is a challenge for all of us because we cannot do the networking as good as we are used to. And um, in my opinion, networking is one of the most important aspects of a conference. We try to actually include networking possibilities here. We will come to this in a few minutes and tell you how this works. Um, so we hope that you also can take the chance now in this virtual conference to do networking. It is so important. Due to the pandemic, we also added a special track on ad hoc distance learning. Many of us had the challenge to quickly move from a more, let's say, local way of teaching to a digital or online way of teaching. And I think many teachers around the world, many instructors, many lecturers around the world had a huge effort and we got a couple of interesting papers on how you can transit into ad hoc distance learning very quickly. So we have um, a couple of experiences here. This is a truly international conference, um, as you can see in the distribution of the authors into many different countries and also in the distribution of the PC members. We have many participants from the US and from Germany but also from um, around the world. And I think this is already very amazing that we have so many different people from so many different countries. I think we have the whole um, time span around the world, which makes it very challenging to organize the conference. Um, it's basically impossible that all of you participate at the sessions at the same time. So we had to be um, very creative in how to organize the conference. And um, I think it's amazing that so many different companies are represented here. And you see that we even have um, a, a big field for others where 11% um, are in, but um, this is um, another um, 10 to 15 countries, which basically did not fit into this pie chart. Um, so there are even more countries um, available in this, con in this conference. Okay, Bastian, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the timeline? 
Yes, thank you, Stefan. Um, so as you all know, um, the Conference of Software Engineering Education and Training is uh, aims to be the world's foremost conference in, on, on, well, just that, software engineering education and training. And um, not so long ago, it was the decision was made that um, the, the, the CSEED conference shall take place every other or so year uh, as a standalone conference then joined with the Hawaiian uh, Conference on System Science and uh, also the, every other other year as a joint conference um, if with, with ICSI. The last iteration of, of this conference was at Hicks as a special track, and that was all, all the way back in January of 2019 when we made the decision that the 2020 edition of the conference ought to be uh, a standalone conference and ideally, you know, um, sometime in the, in the later half of, 2000 to, of 2020. So um, Stefan and I had the absolute um, uh, distinct, uh, distinction of being appointed as the general chairs and, and Bert, of course, too. And um, we made in July 2020, we made the, the decision that, OK, um, uh, we are, we're going to have this conference in Munich uh, at Stefan and, and Bernd's uh, organization, the Technische, Technische Universität München. And uh, we also made the decision that it's going to happen in July after con uh, consulting other um, conferences about the same topic and other software engineering conferences. That seemed like a prudent time for us, and the majority of people would agree. Um, uh, we, we were very lucky that between April and July, we were able to, to assemble this, this small team of absolutely dedicated people, including Elke and Marian and Moritz and Patricia and Nadine, who's been doing an outstanding job in publicity and, and so on, and, and all of these wonderful humans that have helped us in the small things with the large things, we were able to publish the CFPs, sometimes the calls for papers, sometimes in July. Um, soon thereafter, roughly in November last, last year, so pretty much a year ago, um, the, those of you who had the um, privilege of attending yesterday's and Monday's um, workshops and satellite events, some of which are also happening today and tomorrow, um, these were pr proposed to us pretty much a year ago, just to show you how long how long the time span has been since, well, for, since then and, and, and until now. And re re remember, at that point, we were still thinking we we're going to have the conference in July. And then the papers were submitted, and then the con corona pandemic decided to crush hopes, dreams, and, and any kind of... Um, um, desire to be together. Well, maybe not our desire to be together, but the ability to be together. So very early on, we, we realized that this um, pandemic might be a problem for our conference and it might not be safe for us to, um, to, to be all together in Munich, let alone possible, right? Um, at that time, also, most of the participants started getting a little nervous and emailed us and said, hey, listen, uh, we really want to attend your conference, but my institution doesn't allow travel anymore, or I don't feel safe anymore, or what can we do? So in the beginning of April, we were there, we therefore, um, after consulting with the steering committee, decided that we should postpone the conference until later that year, possibly until after the election in the United States is over. The steering committee very much agreed with our, with our thoughts on this. And um, meanwhile, everything else uh, uh, went going on. The papers were still being reviewed. We were still doing our due diligence to the authors because our core idea was, no, the most important part about this conference series is exchanging knowledge and helping each other learn and grow as instructors and grow as, as pedagogues in, uh, in the field of software engineering. So we wanted to deliver that, that value to the prospective participants even though um, circumstances were less than ideal. <clears throat> and this, on the other hand, did not only come with challenges, but also with an opportunity. Stefan already mentioned it. Um, it, was, it was then when, when Marian and Elke had the idea of, hey, um, you know, we are all in the same boat here. We all are facing the same problem. We are all facing the, the challenge of having to move our upcoming spring or upcoming fall semester uh, to, an, to massively massive in-person classes to remote distance instruction, there's an opportunity here for us to do a special call. So we had we used the opportunity here between then and now to um, add this extra call. We were able, Marianne and Elke will talk about this a little bit more, but I think um, I think this particular special track that, that was the result of that um, is 
is particularly interesting and particularly um, enjoyable. In early August, um, it became clear to us that the uh, situation in, in Europe and across the world wasn't progressing to a nice place where we could meet in person. So um, we moved the conference online. And if you're here watching the stream or are you attending the Zoom session, then you have done everything right and you have joined us here. And by biggest and on, on behalf of all the organizers, I am very, very pleased that you're here. I can't begin to express my thanks, not only for attending this conference, not only for bearing with us and in, in the whole year and a half of turmoil of trying to um, to organize this, but also for being so incredibly patient. Every single person that, every single question we received over email were natural questions, understandable questions regarding uncertainty and resolving it. Every single person that came in contact with us had nothing but support and nothing but appreciation that they expressed. And, and I'm, I was really touched by that. And I was really pleasantly surprised by how much dedication the participants, you guys, have put forward already in the preparation of the of the conference. Aside from us, every, all the things that we ask you to do in terms of paper deadlines and things, you've done great. And this is my extraordinary pleasure that we have <clears throat> 141 uh, participants from across the world. Not surprisingly, the majority being German and uh, and and from the United States, but appro approaching half the conference are not. And are not from those two countries. And this is, this is my, I, I think this is um, very, something that we are, we will be happy about for a long time to come. Um, waiting until the slide flips over because apparently the delay is longer than I anticipated. Um, there we go. As you know, we are using we are using some conference technology. And again, if you're here, you already know this, but we're using Zoom for the live sessions. Every live session uh, is streamed concurrently on YouTube. So um, if uh, you know your 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 family needs your attention in the background, or your your students run into your office and need something urgent, you can hop onto the YouTube link, click pause, and then re and resume attending the conference later. You will not be able to um, participate this way with discussions, but at least you won't miss the discussions that are going on. So um, please consider YouTube the backup. We'll, we'll stream everything live. Um, and then we are uh, extraordinarily privileged to have our friends from TNG um, uh, provide us with technical support with this wonderful um, uh, virtual office front end, which is um, basically a website that joins together the Zoom channels by, by a, comp a conference program. Thank you, Stefan. Um, by conference program and links on the one hand the the zoom links down here wherever it says join wherever the the, the little plaque here is high, white and highlighted we can see that this session is currently active you hit the join button and your zoom will pop open and you'll be immediately joining all these other wonderful people that are sitting in the uh, in the corner here on this little on this little card and you can, uh, you can join them, or you can launch the live stream from there, or when you click on this, um, thank you, and when you click on the channel description, for example, tutorial on experiential learning accessibility, you click on that, you will, it will open your Slack client, and you can participate in the background chat. You can exchange data and files if you want, just by dragging and dropping. And um, all the things that we are, we are uh, offering you here um, will be, available to you forever. So we have no, um, whatever forever means in the context of technology, but we have no plans on ever closing this, this workspace on Slack. So if you wanna come back in the future and look at the things that were said, look at the files that were uploaded or anything, um, feel free. We encourage you to make heavy use of, of all of those offerings. Um, we also, most importantly, Stefan, Stefan said it, uh, networking is the most important part of the conference, and I couldn't agree more, which is why at the top of the virtual office uh, um, website, you'll always see these networking sessions that are always open, and you can see who's there, you can jump together, you can jump in the, in the imagine this like a, like a coffee break, like a breakout room, where we can just join and, and, and enjoy a delicious Timmy Horton's coffee with your friends over there. Um, whenever there's a, a, a networking room busy, another one will open so you can go into one by yourself and wait for others to join or you can join the conversation that's going on. Or you can click on the join button up here and randomly join um, some room um, if you if you want to meet new people, sort of like, you know, um, 30 second dating type thing. Um, 
we were to do that. Um, for the conference, uh, like we said, we are we are proud of the fact that the conference is very collaborative and very discussion centric. So we're hoping that the like Stefan mentioned before the keynote, uh, before the opening, um, we are hoping that that the, the discussions will be fruitful and collaborative, and and critical and uh, but positive. So no one likes a jerk. Be nice to each other, but uh, ask controversial questions. We're it's not be uh, above us to to ask things that that might be if we have a different opinion or something like that. Um, we hope that you enable your webcam whenever you can. And if you happen to have one of those, if you're like me and you keep those little post-its over your webcam just in case, now is a good time to peel it off um, to, so make sure everyone can see you. And you will join each Zoom session um, uh, on mute. That is the default setting. Um, so before you speak, don't forget to unmute yourself. And other than that, just please... Um, Enjoy the YouTube videos that are available for you already before or after the conference and uh, enjoy, simply lean back and enjoy. We're, we're doing some concurrent publicity on Twitter and we hope that you are um, joining the discussion there as well. And please uh, share ideas that you find particularly interesting on Twitter. Use the hashtag at uh, hashtag CC2020. Um, to, to be retweeted by us. And please, for posterity, enjoy our MailChimp mailing list. We promise we will never share your data. We will never spam you with irrelevant stuff, but we will occasionally tell you uh, about new uh, exciting things that happen in this field of software engineering education. And I Can I jump in for a moment, Bastian? Please do, Bernd. Um, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much, Gerhard, and especially my, most, uh, my congratulations to your birthday today. I can't believe oh. you're here and not celebrating, but maybe that is your celebration. This is working really well. Thank you very much. Thanks to you and thanks to TNG. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that's really a pleasure being here. So that's a birthday present for me that the conference is today. Happy birthday, Ben. Uh, yes. Gerhard. I did not no, know no, that. Not you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sorry. Really Happy birthday, Gerhard. In, in, in three months, you haven't told us once that your birthday was today. I'm. I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm 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 sur surprised with your humility and also uh, also also a little a little mad. Except I'm not, of course. Huh? But, uh, happy okay. birthday. We can actually all think about it, but I think he's right in the background. It's all being recorded, so let's not do this singing here, right? Sing along, but say thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'm looking forward to a great conference. Right. So other than Gerhard and his birthday, we also like to, to share, share our acknowledgements to everyone. This conference is not is, a, is truly a team effort. And uh, most importantly, you guys are here because you're the participants and it wouldn't be a conference without you. We also like to appreciate, uh, express our appreciation um, to IEEE for sponsoring this event. We'd like to thank all the authors um, that have submitted their papers, the reviewers for doing such a tremendous job. Um, submitting the reviews on time and in such a high quality. We'll thank everyone who dedicated themselves to become a session chair. And of course, the steering committee for every all the support we received and received nothing but encouragement, nothing but for support from them that we are very, very happy about. I think this is part, this is the end of, of my time. Um, I would like now to hand over the stick to Marianne and Ilke. Okay. Uh, welcome also from Marion and me um, in our role of um, the XEED uh, 2020 uh, PC chairs. Uh, when two years ago it was decided for XEED 2020 to um, be um, held at uh, Munich, um, I was really happy to have uh, XEED back again in Europe after a five years absence. We, have, we had the last uh, European uh, XEED uh, 2015 in uh, Italy. And uh, prior uh, to that, we, we, we could uh, uh, organize uh, XEED in Klagenfurt uh, with uh, Andreas uh, uh, Bolin. Uh, well, uh, but then, um, uh, I did not imagine uh, that uh, it would be just in Munich time zone only. And uh, well, uh, not uh, in Munich as a, a conference location. So anyway, just try to... Go ahead. 
but I think it's, it worked okay, good. Anyway, um, it's my pleasure today uh, to give you a short overview of the program, uh, which already started uh, on Monday uh, this week uh, with the two um, workshops and uh, tutorial uh, days, uh, including also yesterday's sessions uh, of the Academy of Software Engineering Education and Training. Uh, the main conference with, uh, you already heard the uh, overall theme, Educating for the Future, uh, will include two keynote addresses. And um, uh, the research track consisting of presentations on full and short research papers, industrial training experience reports, uh, and on uh, papers uh, on the ad hoc distance uh, teaching, reporting the first experience on instantly uh, changing uh, our ways of teaching uh, software engineering due to the pandemic. So uh, yesterday we already had a post and tool presentations and also one of the two panels. And um, uh, beside the academy event, uh, we have three virtually located, co-located uh, workshops as well as four uh, tutorials. So quite a manifold program. Um, thanks to you all for the contribution, for contributing to this uh, colorful uh, program. Okay. Um, well, after the welcome note, Rick Kasman uh, will continue the opening session with uh, his keynote on reflections in teaching architecture design. And the second keynote uh, will be given by Pierre Borg, um, entitled The Swibok Guide More Than 20 Years Down the Road. This will be given at uh, the very last session, our closing session, uh, which is uh, dedicated to uh, the Nancy Mead Award uh, for Excellence in Software Engineering Education. Uh, and in this session, we will also uh, uh, we would also like to honor authors of the best papers as well as um, members of the program committee as uh, for for their excellent uh, work. So don't miss the last session. Um, maybe it will be you who will be surprised. Okay, so. Um, as we have heard, um, traditionally, XEED is a really international conference. Here you can see um, the countries um, with, uh, um, where all the authors uh, came from. We had uh, 30 countries uh, um, from uh, authors. Um, who uh, submitted the pap papers and you see in the blue color all the countries, um, all these uh, 30 countries, you know. Well, um, good. Yeah. And uh, here you see the international distribution of uh, the PC consisting of uh, uh, 68 uh, program committee uh, members um, representing uh, 17 countries. Uh, we had uh, reviews for all tracks uh, in uh, the main program and each PC member reviewed uh, five to six papers. The review process started um, uh, with a short period of paper bidding. And based on these uh, bids, uh, each paper got uh, three to four referees, uh, such that in the end, uh, we at least got uh, uh, three um, review reports uh, per paper. Uh, we also had a double blind review 
for the research papers. And after the review report uh, submission, uh, we started an online discussion phase among the, review, among the reviewers for each paper. So uh, the results of the review process are presented here. Out of 87 research papers, we accepted 18 full research papers, nine short papers, one industrial training experience report, and four papers on the ad hoc distance teaching, um, yielding uh, to an overall acceptance rate of 37%. For the post and tool presentation, um, uh, we accepted four contributions out of eight. And as a second step, uh, we accepted uh, four other contributions originally uh, submitted uh, to other tracks, rejected by the reviewers, but nevertheless um, considered to be valuable, to be part of the conference, uh, but in a kind of shorter form as a poster presentation. So that leads us to the program, the actual program uh, of uh, the main two days. And I just want to give the slides as well as uh, the microphone over to my fellow um, program Chair Marian. Marian, can you? Yes. Thank you, Elke, for the introduction. Um, right. We are very excited to have eight paper sessions in total, um, which will be today and tomorrow. And I guess this is uh, the advantage of a virtual conference. You see, the duration differs. So we were just able to fit papers together that really fit each other and we're not, uh, we had not the duty to merge something together that does not really fit. We could just uh, change uh, the time of these sessions. And um, we planned all these sessions in such a way that you can attend them all. So we have no parallel tracks in the main program. Um, as Bastian and Stefan mentioned earlier, there are lots of materials out there where the authors already presented their papers. And in these sessions, there will basically be uh, a pitch of the paper, a brief summary, and then we hope for lots of intense and interesting discussions about uh, the, uh, the paper, but also about the general topics of the sessions. Um, what I want to mention also is that one of these sessions is a special track on a talk distance teaching. And as we already heard, the conference delayed. We had uh, a bit more time to plan the conference. And we, in discussions in the uh, organizing committee, we, we uh, yeah, we got to know that we ourselves struggle with getting the teaching experience online for the students. And then we said, okay, but this is really what uh, the International Conference on Software Engineering, Education and Trade in We opened a second call for uh, papers that discuss and report experiences about how the authors, how the educators transferred some normal typical classroom style lecture into such online material, such a talk distance teaching was introduced. Um, the other paper sessions are based, uh, about project-based learning. They are about studios, industry orientation, uh, teaching programming and DevOps. And this is uh, what you typically see at a, a CC and uh, so not that uh, um, may be different from the, but we believe that the topics that the papers themselves are different, are new. Um, they uh, 
emphasize new trends, um, uh, modern perspectives, and deal with educating the future. And then we also have uh, papers on feedback assessment and grading mechanisms. Uh, this is something that had all, has also to do with online teaching. So how can you assess people that are not in the room that you only have a distance relationship to? And um, then we will also have tomorrow sessions on the development processes or teaching development processes and in general about teaching and learning strategies and what challenges there exist. We also have a poster track, or I should say we had a poster track, it was yesterday, and but it's a virtual conference. So you can, if you're interested, visit the stream or the reported stream from yesterday and have a look at the paper session again, uh, sorry, at the poster session again, and uh, you can also see the posters and all the related materials. Um, yes. Um, so we have also heard a lot about the this flipped conference format. And uh, what I want to mention again is there are, the papers are out there, the presentation videos are out there. Feel free to watch them in advance, but. Also, we understand that maybe you have not the time to watch all videos in advance. The materials will stay out there. So also after the conference, feel free to uh, dive more into the materials, dive more into the talks, dive, and then use this for collaboration with the authors, or contact them right after the conference. Um, so we already talked about the flipped paper sessions. I will briefly summarize this again. Typically, the authors will present a very brief summary of their contribution, just two or three minutes. And thereafter, we want to start the discussion. And we said, OK, how can we ensure that the discussion really starts? And therefore, we assigned one of the authors of the other papers as discussant. So, uh, the task of this discussant was to read the paper in advance, see the video in advance, and prepare a discussion, summarize the contribution, and uh, st start the discussion so that we hope that the uh, discussion uh, starts right away after the um, presentation of the summary slides. And what we very much hope for is that we have, we'll have a discussion with the entire audience. Um, yesterday in the poster session, this has worked out very well, so that all the authors of the poster session have discussed on uh, different topics that uh, arose during the poster session, and we hope that we will see much more of these discussions in the uh, technical sessions or in the sessions of the technical program. Um, yeah. Bastian and uh, Stefan already told everything uh, that you need to know about virtual office and YouTube, I guess. So uh, yeah, join us there. You should, if you're seeing this, you already uh, got to find the links and you're very welcome to be here. So this is a bit about the available materials. Um, you also find all these links in the Slack channel, in the lobby, and on many other sites. Actually, uh, it is a bit, um, yeah, it, is, it might be a bit distracting at some times that there's so much material out there. We, we learned ourselves that it is a total different thing to have a, a conference, a physical conference, and online information about the conference, or if you have a virtual conference information about the virtual conference and all the uh, materials online. So we hope that uh, you will find and access all of them. And uh, what I just want to mention when it comes to the pre-published papers, this is a, a version of IEEE that is provided to the participants of this conference. So this link will uh, end working uh, a couple of days after the conference. So um, 
this is something that you might want to check out just during the conference if your institution has no access to IEEE, where you will find the uh, papers in the IEEE digital database when they are uh, officially published sometime after the conference. We also have two panels uh, that Mike Barker organized. Um, this is our, the first idea of Mike was to have two very interactive workshop sessions, but as we have already heard, then uh, the pandemic uh, hit us. And so uh, we, we found it a good way to have this as panels. And one panel was already yesterday, but as I mentioned, feel free to use the, the links to this and re, uh, review or receive this uh, panel. Um, but if you're more interactive uh, type of person, then we have a second panel for you. This is tomorrow in the morning European time. Uh, research ideas for the next five years. And there will be, for instance, Timothy, Le Timothy Lethbridge will stick around and will also be on this panel. But uh, Mike's idea was there to have a highly interactive open panel. So we very much hope, and this is a very cool idea, that you will all participate in there and provide your thoughts and discuss your points of view. And um, yeah, let's make this a uh, very interactive panel and uh, yeah it's I, I think it's also about this community about what this conference in the next years should be about and so uh, yeah share your thoughts on this and we are looking very much uh, forward to this so there have also been very many satellite events most of them were Monday and Tuesday. And so they are over right now, but once again, the materials are out there. Uh, you can review or receive the, the uh, YouTube links and you can still contact the authors. But what I want uh, to highlight once more, we had another schedule when these were submitted. So also these organizers did an incredible job to keep it about such a long time uh, the, they are uh, were going to uh, contact the authors or participants in these workshops to plan these tutorials and even uh, notice the tutorials, the presenters, they applied for a physical tutorial and all of them said, yes, we accept the challenge. We want to bring this online. We want uh, CSEET to, uh, 2020 to be an a interactive uh, online event. And they also part of, uh, uh, shared the information on this. And they brought all these events online. And this is an incredible job. We are, we again want to thank the organizers very much. For and I just want to mention one uh, tutorial. It's the last one in this line, a gamification tool set for improving engagement of students in software engineering courses. Because this is, and I'm very sorry, this is a mistake. It's today in the evening. It's today from 18 to 21. Uh, Central European time. So this is one thing where you still have the chance to participate live, but please also use the opportunity to uh, see all the materials of the events that have already been uh, conducted. And finally, we have to thank very, very many people. We want to thank all the submitting authors, not only the ones that got their paper published, but we were very honored that so many people found the conference a good place to send their papers 
of the hand in their papers. And we hope that the feedback they received, even if the paper got not accepted for the main program, was very helpful. And we very much would like to see revised versions of these papers in the next conferences. So um, thanks to all of these authors. Of course, thank to all of these 68 PC members, as Elke mentioned, every PC member um, was it, uh, worked on every track. So in every uh, research track, in every category, uh, every PC member reviewed uh, posters, reviewed industry submissions, reviewed uh, contributions to the special track, reviewed main research papers. And we know that this was a very challenging task to keep track on all of these different uh, areas and tracks. And we are very thankful for uh, uh, this very good work we want also to place emphasis on that we received many reviews on time and this in the time of the pandemic is it's nothing that we uh, could have hoped for so very thank you very much to the reviewers that were on time and also in some cases we must admit that we needed some extra feedback some extra reviews and also for the reviewers that stepped in there please thank you very much I also mentioned the different event organizers, uh, maybe the Academy for Software Engineering Education and Training, the uh, different workshops, the tutorials, and Mike Barker for the panels. Um, thank you very much. We believe that you made an incredible job out there and bringing all this uh, to an online conference is amazing. We want to thank a bit in advance the session chairs that will have the uh, task to keep the discussions going in the uh, sessions that will maybe uh, have a look on a fair distribution so that we can discuss every paper in each session and uh, thank you very much for this. Who we particularly want to thank is Patricia Brockman and Moritz Marutschke, who were our satellite event chairs. And as I said, that the organizers did an incredible job in bringing their events online. So did these both of them that were uh, very into these, that were in constant contact with the organizers, that were did so much, spent so much effort in. Uh, supporting the organizers and supporting us uh, in bringing these events online. Of course, our thanks also go to Bernd Brügge and all the members of the conference organization committee, which I cannot mention here all by names, uh, but there were very many people involved in Munich and uh, this uh, not only in Munich, but all around the world, but uh, for the organization, main organization, it was Munich and uh, thank you very much uh, for supporting us and, of course, the steering committee members that provided so useful help and insights and uh, advice. And last but obviously not least, we want to thank Bastian and Stefan, who it was a pleasure to work with and uh, that did far more than uh, the program chairs could expect from their general chairs, I believe. And so uh, thank you too very much. So, session and please enjoy the program. We hope that we uh, created a program that is very entertaining and uh, enjoy, uh, to be enjoyed. And please enjoy the conference. So at this point, I want to briefly ask if there are any technical questions about the conference left. Okay, this seems not to be the case. In this case, we will begin with a conference. And this means we will begin with the first keynote. And we are very honored to have Rick Kassman here. And 
I, I do not know how to introduce Rick Hasman because everyone should know him. Uh, this is the guy with the software architecture things. And uh, he, uh, just to mention the software architecture analysis method, the architecture trade off analysis method, or the cost benefit analysis method, one of his major contributions in the field. And we are very excited to have him here and uh, talking about reflections in teaching architecture design. And uh, yeah, just one other thing I want to mention before I hand over to Rick is that Rick is a professor in Hawaii. Okay, this is once the point to be jealous. And next, this means it's in the middle of the night for him. And we appreciate it very much that he said, okay, I will give this keynote, even if it's in the middle of the night, and it is the only time slot we've found where the rest of the world will have a ch decent chance to attend this keynote. And uh, we appreciate it very, very much. And we are looking forward to this keynote very much. We uh, are uh, very excited about this. And be just before handing over right now, um, regarding your comments, or if you want to discuss some things after the keynotes, feel free to also use the comment section during the keynote, but please do not expect Rick to answer these questions during his keynotes. He will uh, uh, come back to them afterwards. So, um, Rick, thank you very much, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, the uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I should be able to share my screen now. Let's try it. Um, continue. Okay. Hopefully you can see my slides. Can I get a thumbs up? Just fine, Good. yes. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, well, thank you for that lovely, uh, flattering introduction. And yes, it is, well, not the middle of the night, the, but it's 11.20 uh, p.m here in uh, Honolulu, but that's okay. I tend to be a night owl anyway, so I, uh, I seldom see the sunrise, so not a problem for me. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about my 20 plus years of experience in teaching software architecture and software architecture design. Uh, and I'll start off a little bit self-indulgently with uh, an introduction uh, which actually has, in addition to being self-indulgent, actually has a little bit of a purpose in terms of understanding why I'm interested in the things that I'm interested in and how I got to where I am in my career. So um, for those of you who don't know, I'm not actually, at least not originally an American. I, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I attended the University of Waterloo, where I studied mathematics and computer science but actually I spent more of my time studying English and music. Hmm, not a typical path for a uh, software engineer, um, but this um, luckily for me, fortunately for me, ended me up here in Oxford, uh, where I did my master's research working at the Oxford University Press. And I was working on the computerization of the Oxford English Dictionary which led me here to a uh, beautiful leafy Pittsburgh. That's a picture of one part of Carnegie Mellon University for those of you who, who don't know. And uh, eventually just down the street from there to the Software Engineering Institute. So somehow I went from English and music to, to software engineering. I, I don't really understand it myself, but here I am. Uh, and that maybe even more mysteriously led me here to uh, Honolulu. Uh, I don't live in Waikiki, but that's the most famous view that anyone knows of, of Honolulu, where I spend my days more or less living like this. Okay, that's a joke. So what is the, <laughs> what's the point of this, right? What's the, the purpose of this, uh, as I say, self-indulgence? Well, a couple things. One is I like multidisciplinary. Right? I believe that um, social issues, people issues, 
usability issues, contextual factors are as important as technology in terms of, well, the technology itself, but also in terms of uh, educating people. And presumably, since you people have all self-selected to come to a conference on uh, education and training, you uh, at least somewhat subscribe to that view. So um, uh, again, with the nice introduction, uh, you, you spoke about my personal evolution. Um, in, in 94, I published my first paper on software architecture, and this was the SAM, the Software Architecture Analysis Method. And the, um, the evolution, the revolution, I don't know, of, of the SAM was that it was scenario-based. So in that method, one elicits, posits scenarios as architectural test cases. These are, a scenario is essentially a falsifiable hypothesis about an architecture or about the design of an architecture, which you can then map onto the architectural decisions that have been made or not made to determine whether the architecture has, if, it's, if it exists or is likely to, if it uh, is just a design in someone's head, uh, satisfy the scenario, satisfy the requirements. So it's a falsifiable hypothesis. And this was kind of the, in, in you know, a couple sentences, the, the insight of the, of the SAM. This then evolved to the architecture trade-off analysis method a few years later, because the SAM really just focused on modifiability and the, uh, there's much more to creating an architecture, obviously, than worrying about mod modifiability. And so in the ATAM, we tried to get a little bit more sophisticated about how we elicited and captured scenarios. And we were interested in scenarios along multiple dimensions and, um, and interested in the, the trade-offs among the various forces that were affecting an architecture. And that led us to the cost-benefit analysis method, the CBAM, like four, I like four-letter acronyms, it seems. Um, and the, the, the insight there was one day having done an ATAM, I remember sitting around after the ATAM feeling pretty good about myself because we had found some I thought interesting in, insights about the architecture that we were analyzing. And uh, just talking to the architects informally after this, and, and I said, well, you know, to deal with this risk, you're probably gonna do such and such, right? And to deal with this risk, you're probably gonna do that other thing, right? And they looked at me like I was from Mars and they said, oh, we can't do that. That would blow our budget. We can't do that. That, that would ruin our schedule. And I realized, duh, that business concerns, cost and schedule, are just as important as quality. Uh, and so you really have to consider architecture from a uh, holistic perspective. What I'm gonna be talking about today was um, a method ADD, the Attribute Driven Design Method, uh, since those three earlier methods were about analyzing the decisions that have already been made, that someone has made. But um, in many cases, we were challenged to help people do design in the first place. If, if they came to us and said, we have a problem, we don't have an architecture yet, what do we do? And so that's really uh, the, the, the genesis of the ATAM. So what I'm gonna be focusing on is first of all, why we need methods at all. Why we need methods, why it's important to teach methods. So why we need a methodical approach to architecture design, and um, why we have turned to gameplay as a means of helping to teach the method or the methods, in fact, that we've created. And, oops, and supporting that, tools. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I was giving the uh, Academy of Software Engineering Education and Training uh, one, of the, one of the talks yesterday. And I kept saying over and over in my talk there, design is hard, right? And I'm gonna say that a bunch of times today as well. And I will argue that you need tool support not only to do design and to analyze design, but to teach design as well. And I'll, that will be the, the, fourth, the fourth quarter of my talk. Um, and um, 
these games, these tools are not ends in themselves, but they're a way of extending our reach of allowing us to be better at transitioning what we know, allowing us to scale up what we are able to do, allowing us to be more objective. Uh, and, and this objectivity can then help support empirical studies, which if done right, can form the basis of replication packages. And this can you know, give us a nice empirical basis on which to make judgments about what to teach and, and how to teach or what to do, what a practitioner should do and how to do it. So I'm gonna focus for a little while on this design method, ADD, uh, and talk about why, um, what, what motivated us to create a design method and what it means to be a method and how we've tried to fulfill those goals. So let's take a step back, first of all, and just talk about software architecture as this kind of big lumpy design notion. So the Software Engineering Institute has hundreds of definitions that people have contributed over the years of uh, software architecture. Um, what you see if you go out into the world, if you, uh, you know, put your, your backpack on your back and you, you head out into the rainforest of, of software architecture and start collecting specimens is box and line diagrams, right? There's some boxes and those represent some elements, parts of the systems, components, depending on you know, who's written it, they're gonna use a different nomenclature and the lines are relationships among the parts. And these may be runtime relationships, they may be um, uh, design time relationships. And so you see these kinds of pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures. And I didn't make up any of these. All of these were designs that were submitted to me as part of architecture analyses that I've done. And all of them were to, to greater or lesser degrees head scratchers. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. So the question really becomes, what can we tell from these pictures? If this is what you get, when you say to someone, show me your architecture, uh, if you get anything at all, sometimes you get a blank stare right? Or a sheepish uh, admin, uh, admission that they don't actually have an architecture or haven't thought it through or haven't documented or not quite sure. Maybe one day they used to have one, but it's, it's diverged since then. Um, but even in the best case, what can we tell from these pictures? So to understand that, again, we'll take a, a step back. Um, we've defined software architecture in, in our book, Software Architecture in Practice. We're working on the fourth edition as we speak, in fact, should be uh, off to the, the publisher in a few weeks. Uh, but in the third edition, we defined it as um, architecture as a set of structures needed to reason about the system, which comprise software elements, relations among them and properties. So it's, it's elements, relationships and properties. Okay, so what are the implications of this definition? Architecture is an abstraction. Abstractions are hard, right? But we, we need abstractions. We absolutely need abstractions for designing, for analyzing, for reasoning about architecture. No one can keep all of the details in their head for anything but a trivial system, right? Nobody can. And so we need abstractions to tame complexity, uh, Abstraction allows us to look at a system in terms of more abstract elements with interactions and properties and relationships with each other. And these properties support reasoning about those interactions. If those interactions are modules, I can ask how easy is it to change this one without affecting this one? If those are some kind of uh, threads or processes, I can say, well, if I lengthen the execution time of this one, will it affect this one? Will it starve this one for resources or something like that? So by having these abstractions and annotating with properties, I can start to ask questions that are meaningful in terms of some architectural quality, some architectural response measures that I want to design into the system that I want to analyze the system for. So architecture is about elements and how they relate to each other. This abstraction is absolutely essential to taming complexity. We can't deal with all of the complexity. Nobody has a big enough head to keep all of that information in their brain at all times. So we need to 
abstract. We need to divide in order to conquer. However, in general, most people don't like abstractions. Most people don't do very well with abstractions, right? I, I forget who said it, but I remember someone talking about the, the relative lack of algebra fun clubs in our society speaks volumes for how much we as a species enjoy playing with abstractions, right? Doesn't happen. So other implications of this definition, every system has an architecture, right? Because every system has elements that have properties and have relationships, but having an architecture is different from having an architecture that is known, having an architecture that is documented, having an architecture that came out of a rational process versus one that merely emerged. But whether you design an architecture or not, you will get one. You will get one. You will have elements and relationships and properties. You just might not like what you get. And the next thing I'm gonna say is, is part of my motivation for why I believe we desperately need methods and tools to manage this complexity, to manage these abstractions. So this first example was from a system that I built many years ago uh, with a grad student. It was called Vanish. It was a visualization system. Back uh, in, in those days, I was doing a lot more work on HCI. And uh, we were building the system that could flexibly um, uh, visualize different domains and use different kinds of GUIs, different kinds of visualization toolkits to do it. So we adopted a, a UI reference model at the time called the uh, Arch model. And this had these five major components, a functional core on, on the one side, a presentation on the other side, a dialogue in the middle, and then these two adapter components that kept the, the dialogue from being too tightly tied to the functional core on the one side or too tightly tied to the specifics of the presentation on the other side. So it had these, this reference model had these five major components. We built the Vanish system based on this architecture. At least we thought we did. When we reverse engineered it later, we realized that this was in fact what we had built. We had violated our own separation of concerns. We had my, violated our own modularity rules. And this was the best possible case, right? We were the architecture people there was only two developers, me and the grad student, which meant you know he did most of the work, quite frankly. Uh, and we, we believed in architecture and we adopted an architecture from the very start and we got it wrong. Okay, you might say it's Kaysman, he's an academic, he doesn't really know how to build software. You know, He's not a real software engineer. Um, a few years after that, in a context of a different project, we were uh, reverse engineering Duke's Bank which uh, if you're old, you might remember Duke's Bank as being a, um, uh, a teaching example that Sun Microsystems published for J2EE architectures. And the idea they were showing, again, a sort of reference model of how to build these applications. So you had some uh, clients, some front ends, maybe a web client on the, on the one side and you had database tables, databases that you were talking to on the other side. And in the middle, you had enterprise Java bean stuff. You had session beans and you had entity beans. And session beans were supposed to talk to the user interface and entity beans were supposed to talk to the database. And then session beans, if they wanted information, talk to the entity bean. And Sun said in their, in their rules, session beans should never directly uh, called the database, right? That's, that's a no-no, that's violating separation of concerns. Except that when we reverse engineered J their uh, Duke's Bank example, session beans were calling the database. They violated their own architecture. In this, their teaching example, the example that they used to promote J2EE to the world, right? So what's the point here? What is the point here? The point, uh, before I move on, the point is that architecture is largely invisible, right? These kinds of connections that we make, we make them innocently. We make them for good reasons. We make them because we're focused on implementing a feature or fixing a bug. And the architecture is kind of invisible. So without methods, without tool support, 
which is coming right up, you will get it wrong. I feel quite confident in stating that statement as an absolute. You will get it wrong. And so we owe it to our students to help them get it wrong as little as possible. Okay, so what does it even mean to be architectural? How do we even know what to teach them? What is an architectural decision? So the way I see it, a decision is architectural if it has non-local consequences and, and the end is important here, those consequences matter to the achievement of some driver, uh, a driver being a, a, a driving architectural requirement. So based on this decision uh, de definition, no decision is inherently architectural or non-architectural. So let me give you a, a quick example. Consider a buffering strategy. You've got a component, that component has a buffer in it. You have to choose a buffer, what kind of buffer that is. Is that an architectural decision or not? And the answer, of course, like all good answers in software engineering is it depends, right? So that buffering strategy may have only local uh, implications. It is an implementation detail. The component needs a buffer. You gave it a buffer. No one needs to know even that that buffer exists, right? It doesn't rise beyond the encapsulation boundaries of that component. However, that buffering strategy may have implications for performance if the buffer affects the latency or throughput or jitter of that system, right? If it takes a long time to put something into the buffer or get something out of the buffer, that's gonna have a performance impact. Or it could affect availability if the buffers might not be large enough and information gets lost. If you have a circular buffer and you write over information before you had a chance to pull it off the buffer. Or it might affect modifiability if um, you want to be able to flexibly change buffering strategies in different deployments or different contexts. So the choice of a buffering strategy is not inherently architectural or non-architectural. It depends on the consequences of that decision. Uh, so given this definition, of what an architecture is and this definition of what it means to be architectural and the problems in doing architectural design and, and managing abstractions and managing separation of concerns and all these things that architects are supposed to do, we need a method, or at least I'm gonna claim that we need a method, we need methods. So architecture design is difficult to master and Performing it, doing it well, doing it repeat, repeatably requires that there's a method and that method needs to be principled. There needs to be a reason for, for doing each of the steps in the method and methods provide guidance. So I remember um, yesterday in the AC talk that I gave, I talked about pilots and surgeons and I asked the, the people who were attending, why do pilots and surgeons make heavy use of checklists? Right? These are two highly skilled, highly trained um, classes of, of people. It's really hard to get a job as either, either of those people. And yet they use checklists, right? Did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do this? Did I do that? Did I remember this? Did I ask that question? And they do that because they're human and they have uh, sometimes gaps in their attention or uh, they forget things, or they forget whether they've done things, or they're too focused on something that really has them worked up and they forget about some other thing that they should be paying attention to. So methods keep us on the straight and narrow. Methods give us guidance. Methods tell us, do this next, do that next. Hence, checklists for, for surgeons and, and architects. If we don't have methods, let's turn it around Design is just some mystic activity. You have to be a, a, a person with, with gray hair before you are qualified to be an architect. You have to have shot yourself in the foot enough times and stumbled enough times and gotten up enough times. And that's not very good news for software engineering as a discipline, if that's the only way to become competent in some imp very important aspect of engineering. So um, we created, or 
evolved ADD, the attribute driven design method. We wrote a book about it. Uh, this book is actually the third major iteration of ADD and, and it was um, the result of uh, a lot of, well, trying it in practice and stumbling and falling down and figuring out what worked better and figuring out what people could actually do and not do. So let's take a look at its steps in a little bit of detail. Um, so to begin the method, you need to make sure that you understand the problem as well as you can understand it. Now I understand that a great majority of the world these days are developing in some iterative or agile methodology. And a tenet of that is of course you won't get the requirements all up front. And of course the requirements are gonna change. What I'm saying here is not in conflict with that. I'm not saying you must get all the requirements in advance before you can begin design. I'm saying you should make sure you understand the requirements as well as you can at any stage in design because you're going to be making decisions based on your understanding of those requirements. You're going to um, make trade-offs based on what you believe to be more or less important. And this is um, an easy step to just gloss over. Think, yeah, I know what I'm building. Let's move on to making some design decisions. So before com commencing design, we go through an exercise of asking for quality attribute scenarios and prioritizing them. How, system, how, how fast does the system have to be? Well, fast, right? You'll often get that kind of answer from, from users, from stakeholders. How fast? I don't know, fast. Um, so you need to do better than that because you can't design to such vague uh, requirements. These are not falsifiable hypotheses. So you need to understand what are the, the drivers, the, the most important quality attribute uh, concerns that are going to shape the architecture. And you can only have a few of those. Architectural design cannot optimize for 20 quality attributes. You can optimize for a few scenarios, a handful, five, 10, something like that. You also, of course, need to understand the functional requirements of the system, what it is the system is going to do, is supposed to do, um, but that does not drive design. So um, domain-driven design may be useful in complex domains, but it is not enough to drive architectural decisions, right? Quality attributes and functionality are in fact orthogonal to each other. How do I know this, right? Orthogonal means I can change one without changing the other, right? They're independent. How do I know that they're orthogonal? Well, think about what you do when you do refactoring. You take the same functionality and you repackage it so that one or more of its quality attributes change. I, I refactor so that the system is more maintainable or runs faster or is more robust, has higher availability, is more secure. And exactly what I'm doing there is taking the same functionality, repackaging it and changing some quality attribute dimension. Um, you can think of, uh, well, okay, enough on that point. So assuming that you, you buy that, that they are orthogonal, you could then choose either of them as a starting point for design and, um, the, the right way to do this is to start with the quality attributes because the functionality does not drive the architecture the quality attributes do. The quality attributes will lead to making design choices. You also have to understand the constraints of your system. These may be technical constraints. You have to work on this platform. You have to uh, run on this, this computer. You're only allowed this much memory. Uh, the battery will only last for one hour. So they may be technical constraints. They may be uh, political or legal constraints. They may be schedule constraints. You know, it has to be ready for, for Christmas selling season or it's not worth building. Uh, they may be personal, personnel constraints. My team's only familiar with Java. Uh, we don't have a, a good database person on our team, right? We're, uh, um, uh, we have to, to use the people that we have. We, we want to keep these kinds of people employed. These are other kinds of constraints that architects have to deal with. 
Okay, you've reviewed the inputs, you understand them as well as you can understand them. You cannot design everything at once, nor would you want to. Design is a wicked problem. So you have to choose what part of the system you're gonna focus your energy on at any given time. You have to choose a sub problem to address and make decisions and then iterate. And yes, sometimes you have to backtrack, that's okay, but you need to uh, determine a, a relatively narrow focus for each design iteration. And then we get to the heart of design. You select some part that you need to decompose, you identify some candidates. So I need to um, uh, process this input data and I need to manipulate it and produce some transformed version as output data. Okay, so now I have to decide, well, what, what kind of processing pipeline am I going to implement? What tools and techniques, what technologies am I going to use to do those data transformations? So you would have to identify solutions that would help you achieve those goals. And then you would have to instantiate those solutions. And then you should document something about the decisions that you've made. Um, a clever fellow, uh, Damien Conway, wrote that documentation is a love letter that you write to your future self, right? You document because you won't remember why you did it or even that you did it in six months or in, in, in two years. And certainly other people won't have a, a hope of knowing why, what you did and why you did it. And so we document uh, as a risk mitigation activity. And perhaps you do a little bit of analysis. So we recommend doing at least lightweight analysis as part of design. At the, at the least a reflective activity, but perhaps some kind of peer reviews, design walkthroughs or something more formal like an, like an ATAM. And then you produce a design, perhaps a fragment. Perhaps you've only designed one corner of your system, one subsystem, or perhaps you've only made decisions at a global level, but haven't done the deep dives to design the parts of the system. That's okay, it's an iterative process. Okay, so the heart of the method, method, as I said, is these steps three, four, and five, selecting elements to refine, choosing design concepts, and instantiating them. And the middle of that, selecting design concepts is particularly challenging, right? When you're a designer and you're faced with a world of possibilities, what do you do? How do you make decisions? Uh, fortunately, there's, there's help here. There are many design concepts that are uh, available that are well documented that can guide guide us in doing design uh, and we should do um, we should where possible attempt to reuse design concepts right rather than reinventing the wheel right so we want to where possible um, reuse the expertise, the accumulated wisdom of the people who have gone before us for, for decades. So the creativity then is in selecting the design concepts, adapting them and combining them. That's really what you need to do to be a design, uh, to, be a, to be an architect. You are not inventing new ideas. You should not be inventing new ideas. You should, um, aim to be unoriginal, if at all possible, right? Because that means you are using proven design concepts, proven ideas, things that have some pedigree associated with them. And fortunately, there are lots of design concepts and catalogs of design concepts out there. And these are standard in every engineering discipline. So there are handbooks for civil engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, you name it. it a, traditional engineering discipline has handbooks. And these handbooks tell you uh, about design concepts. They tell you about analysis concepts and analysis methodologies and how you combine the two to create a design that meets um, uh, practical real world requirements and constraints. So what are the equivalent in software engineering? Well, there are reference architectures. 
reference architectures. There's reference architectures for every domain you could imagine, for banking, for automotive, where there's, what is it, AutoSAR for the automotive domain. There's reference architectures for insurance and big data analytics and railway signaling. I mean, if you start looking, you can find a, a, a thousand reference architectures out there. And this is good because this, again, is a kind of collected wisdom of the community over the course of years. We should be teaching this to our students. Do not, do not attempt to start design from first principles. There are assets out there that, that are the results of the hard-won experience of people, and you should be using or reusing those and adapting them um, where required. So uh, there's this, um, my, Microsoft had created and has stopped maintaining this application architecture guide, which I found was a really good example. And I used it, and used it, still use it in teaching. And they've documented many kinds of reference architectures there. But as I say, you can find reference architectures for, for anything. You also need to understand, so reference architectures help you think about structuring the system as a set of logical components and their relationships. You also need to think about how to deploy your system onto hardware. And so there are deployment patterns, how to structure a system from a physical standpoint. And you're going to need to think about this when you're worried about availability, when you're worried about performance, when you're worried about security. Where am I going to locate my data? Who's going to have access to it? What if a server dies? Is there a backup server available? Is it in the data, same data center or not? Because if that data center gets hit by an earthquake, my availability uh, uh, goals may be compromised. And so again, lots of examples of deployment patterns out there. These do not need to be invented. We do not need to rein, uh, reinvent the wheel. And again, there's a set of these identified in the Microsoft application architecture guide, but these days there's all kinds of deployment uh, patterns uh, created by cloud vendors, created by the DevOps community and so forth. Getting a little more primitive, there are tactics. Uh, so we have catalog tactics in software architecture and practice for seven quality attributes, the seven that you see here. And tactics are um, more primitive than patterns, reference architectures, deployment patterns, design patterns. These are all kinds of patterns. Tactics are more primitive. They are the, if, if a pattern is a molecule, a tactic is an atom. So patterns are essentially collections of tactics. Um, when, so why would you use these? Well, you might use these when you don't have an appropriate pattern for the problem at hand. You can do a deeper dive down to first principles or when the pattern that you have doesn't quite fit your needs and you need to um, modify it, you need to adapt it in some way, you can use tactics to, to do that. And of course, there are lots of catalogs of architectural patterns, design patterns. Um, and I, I never get into an argument about what's an architectural pattern versus a design pattern. You can go back to my definition of what's architectural. It's going to be contextual, right? If this helps you make a decision to control some quality attribute property, it has non-local consequences, then that's architectural. So I don't worry and I never get into an argument about whether these are architectural or not. So you all know, I'm sure, uh, many of the, the patterns catalogs that have been out there. This is just a small selection. You see uh, pattern-oriented software architecture that alone is a four volume collection of books of architectural pattern, uh, four volumes of architectural patterns, just that one series. So there's lots of resources out there. And finally, architects do not design, do not conceive of design based on first principles. They are always looking to uh, leverage existing components, middleware, frameworks, databases, uh, front ends, GUIs, all kinds of components are out there to ease your implementation task to lower risk in your implementation. So again, we need to um, teach these kinds of 
concepts to our students, or at least make them aware that this is how design is done. Okay, easy, right? So all you have to do to design an architecture is figure out your iteration goal. What's the problem that you're working on? Identify the potential design concepts that will help achieve that goal, and then choose one or perhaps a couple and combine them. This is the, and then a miracle occurs step, right? But this miracle can be made much more tractable and much more repeatable by following a method and by uh, creating, establishing, teaching from um, established collections of design concepts. How do I know that this works? I mean, amazingly, I think it does work. How do I know that it works, that by providing a method and a proven set of design concepts, design is made tractable, tractable and repeatable? Well, in course after course after course that I've been teaching over the years, I've seen remarkable similarity in the designs produced by architects who follow the ADD method as compared with the relative chaos that we get when we just say, design a solution given these requirements. Okay. So this is again, what we want out of an engineering discipline is we want repeatability and predictability. They don't, if they follow the ADD method, they don't come up with exactly the same design, the same as two civil engineers wouldn't come up with exactly the same design for a bridge over a valley, but they come up with remarkably similar designs and ones that are all demonstrably um, capable of meeting the architectural drivers. Okay, so that's um, why I'm a big believer in methods and the use of methods in teaching. Next thing is turning to games. So I said it already, I'll say it again. Architecture is hard. Learning it is hard. Teaching it is hard, right? Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect said, a doctor can bury his mistakes, but an architect can only advise his clients to plant vines, right? So even in building architecture, they realized, he realized that it's, it's easy to make mistakes and, and you're stuck with those mistakes for a long time. These are big decisions that have big, far reaching, costly consequences. So uh, why is it so hard? Well, one problem is that feedback is hard, right? We learn, we as a species, people learn from examples. We learn from trying, getting feedback and iterating, but feedback is a problem in teaching architectural design. The realm of possible solutions seems bad. It's hard to say your solution is wrong. Right, because everyone thinks they have a good idea of, of how to do it. So our solution to this as a teaching device is a game. Um, and so we, uh, this again was a big part of what I talked about yesterday. We developed this game called Smart Decisions. And the idea of the Smart Decisions game was to lower the bar to entry for people who are learning architectural design for the first time and as a way of giving feedback to learners. A game involves making progress and competing with other, other players or competing with yourself and getting a score. And the score is uh, uh, the beginnings of a conversation, feedback. Why did you get a lower score than that other team? Why did you uh, get a really great score? You know, you did a great job and, and let's understand that. And finally, games lighten the mood. So, um, I heard before my talk about this uh, tutorial on gamification tool set for engaging students, right? Games are engaging, we like, we like games and games are less threatening for us than something that sounds scary like a method with a two, three or four letter acronym. So <clears throat> we play a game and this game has cards and it has dice and it has rounds and it has all the the artifacts that you would expect of a game, but this game follows the ADD method in a structured, slightly simplified version. We walk the students through the process of making design decisions based on 
a catalog of design concepts, reference architectures and patterns and technologies, just the things I was talking about. And along the way, we have the students make decisions and those decisions are associated with scores. And those scores help us to um, give, them, give them feedback and uh, help create teachable moments in the, um, trying to convey the idea of architectural design. So the game just instantiates ADD. We start off by reviewing the inputs and we do a bunch of design iterations and each of those design iterations results in a score. And as we go through the iterations, well, that didn't work very well. As we go through the iterations, the students um, are making a, more and more design decisions that are going to build on the design decisions that they previously made, just like in the real world for better or worse. And again, those become teachable moments. You made this decision back in iteration two and now it's biting you here in iteration four. Why is that? Let's talk about it. So, oh, very nice. So, um, as I said, in, in teaching the game, we walk them through the steps. So we start off by choosing a uh, reference architecture. This is big data, so we, we choose the Lambda architecture. We could have chosen something else, but given the, the uh, requirements for the game, that's the best architecture. And we, again, talk about why it's the best architecture, why it's the, sorry, not architecture, the best reference architecture, and what it means even to make that choice. So that's part of this whole identifying design decisions and then making one, right? Fanning out to the space of possible things. That's really useful to even understand the landscape of the possible design concepts. But then you have to make a decision. In the end, you've got to build a system, not 10 systems. You have to you know, ride one horse till it drops, figuratively speaking. And so we keep iterating until um, we have come up with design choices for all of the major decisions that you need to make in the system. And along the way, we're assigning scores. So there's a scorecard and there's a, a, a scoring methodology and rolling the dice um, uh, introduces a little bit of chance in the system because that is trying to replicate what it's like in the real world to do design. You may make great design choice, but your team implements it poorly. You may make a great technology choice, but then that company goes out of business, right? There is a certain amount of chance. And so we want to um, make people aware of that. And we do that via the dice in the game. So why a game? Oh, I said I was going to say this a lot, and I'm saying it a lot, right? Design is hard, and feedback is hard. A game is less threatening. A game is fun. A game allows us to engage the students in a teaching activity that doesn't feel too much like a teaching activity, right? Steps of a method are so boring, but a game is fun and I can compete with my friends and I get a score and I wanna get a better score than, than my friends or than I did last time or something like that. So it, it really speaks to something uh, deep within us as humans, right? This gets to the, the, the non-technical side of, of how we teach and how we motivate people. Okay, almost done. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So the fourth, um, the fourth fourth of my talk is the shortest, uh, but certainly not the least important. And that's the importance of tools in um, designing and analyzing architectures and in teaching architecture design. So I built much of my career on methods, but Analysis methods have a fatal flaw, right? The SAM, the ATAM, the CBAM, they all had a fatal flaw. Um, the methods themselves just aren't enough. Why are they not enough? Oh, you knew how I was gonna answer that question, right? Analyzing designs is also hard. The results of an analysis using the SAM or the ATAM or the CBAM depend to a, a, a distressingly large degree on the intelligence, experience, and insights of the analyst. They are not very repeatable, certainly in the studies that we've done. Different ATAM evaluators will come up with different risks. It's not to say that they won't add value, 
but it's, it doesn't sound very scientific. It doesn't sound very repeatable. So um, let me talk about a sad story, which actually has a happy ending. Uh, and this is related to a paper that we presented at this conference in 2013. The paper was called Introducing Tools Supported Architectural Review into Software Design Education. And what we did is there were uh, three professors at three universities who were each teaching uh, software design concepts in a semester long design course that was taught to senior undergraduates in the, in the three universities. They were Drexel, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and um, Cal Poly. Um, the, the paper only reports on the Drexel experience, but we did repeat this experiment at, at all three universities. And in the, in the study, the students had been, as I say, taught design and design concepts for a semester. Uh, they were taught not only about design patterns, but design principles like the solid principles. And at the end of the semester, they were given a final project to, to create. And that final project used the design concepts that they had been taught all semester. So it used a decorator pattern, and it used a strategy pattern, and they were given a UML design for this that employed those design concepts, right? Should be easy, right? Well, you know, since the title of this slide is a sad story, that it wasn't easy. Um, and the reason that we found out how poor the students were, let's say, is that they were then asked to extend the design. So they all got the design working. They all got the system working. They all successfully implemented the system. But more than three quarters of them violated the design in meaningful ways, ways that undermined the extensibility of the system. They did not realize that they were undermining the extensibility of the system. And that was perhaps the even sadder part. So again, this is the best case, right? They had just finished a semester long course in design. They were given the design that used those concepts and they still messed it up. Okay, um, it gets worse. I said it was a sad story. So we then did a, a set of interventions, a set of design reviews we had a uh, control group that did no design review. We had a self-review group where the students were given instructions on how to re review their own design. We had a peer review group where they worked together with another student in the class to review their design decisions. And we had instructor-led review. And even with these three different kinds of reviews, many students did not see the design flaws, did not find the design flaws that they had unwittingly introduced. And these design flaws were um, contrary to the intent of the patterns, right? A, a, a pattern, let's say, that, that tries to keep a functionality A separate from functionality B for good reason, because you expect A and B to evolve independently or to change at different rates they were making dependencies between A and B, undermining the intent of the pattern. And um, they only appreciated these design flaws, these design mistakes, when we reverse engineered their systems, this is the tool part, and presented uh, the, the, the flaws and the consequences of those flaws to them. So the reverse engineering was using a tool that we created called Titan. Um, and uh, Titan would create this DSM view of the system, but it would also highlight the design flaws, places where there were uh, unexpected or unwanted couplings, for example. So our conclusion, this is a, just a direct quote from the paper, is that tool support was really important. Let me highlight this first sentence. Most students cannot recognize modularity mistakes without external input and assistance. And you might say, well, reviews should help them. 
But the fact was that most of the interventions didn't help either. Even with the instructors, you could say, well, okay, they, they were just inexperienced reviewers. But even the instructors had a hard time with the reviews until they had the tool support because design is hard. Spotting the design flaws is hard. These, this was a system with, what was it? 24 classes. But real systems in the real world have an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude more classes than that. Your ability to inspect and see design flaws is vanishingly small. So tool support is key for developers in practice, but also for educators, because otherwise we're teaching, we think we're teaching them good practices, but they're not getting it. That was really the sad story. And, and perhaps the happy ending that there is a way out. Okay, so in conclusion, this is not just about students. These results actually mirror our experiences with industrial and open source projects, that most developers do not see designs they do not see their design flaws. Again, they're busy uh, swatting bugs and implementing features, and they do not see these uh, unnecessary, unwanted, flawed design connections that they're making. But tool support made their design flaws much more obvious and then allowed them to make a, a reasoned decision about fixing them. Uh, it's not uncommon, for example, for developers to actually make designs worse through refactoring. Right? Think about that. You're expending a lot of time and effort in refactoring and you actually make the design worse. Why? Because you're not really seeing the design. You're not understanding the design because one head, right? Abstractions, and we're not very good at dealing with abstractions. I've said that too many times now. Okay, I'm done. Final thoughts. You knew I had to end with this. Architecture design is hard, teaching architecture design is hard, but the good news is that over the years, we have found some things that help. A repeatable method that gives people anchor points, steps that they can follow, decisions that they can take, resources that they can appeal to, right? Why is architecture hard? It's about manipulating abstractions. It's about multi-criteria decision-making under uncertainty. And so without this kind of support method, uh, tools, and then the game to kind of provide a, a gentle on-ramp. Without these three things, I think that design and teaching design are going to continue to be hard for a very long time. So with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Oh, and of course, I have to acknowledge my uh, co-authors. Uh, before I, I end the, the talk, got to remember the, uh, I, I do owe a great debt of gratitude to, to my co-authors for all of this work. So, yes, if people have questions or I don't know if... Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, typically, this would be the uh, point where we would hand over you some chocolate and a bottle of wine or so, but... I'm afraid for now we must rely on the postal service. Actually, um, we still owe you a couple of pretzels <clears throat> as soon as you come to Munich eventually. <laughs> I do intend to collect on that one day. <clears throat> I have a question. Can I ask it? Or shall I post it <clears throat> on the chat or? Just go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Rick, <clears throat> first, thanks a lot uh, for this great talk. And um, I have already talked to you about this concern that I have um, earlier. So let me try to repeat this. So I think you treat architecture design and domain analysis as two different islands. Yeah, you say factual requirements and qualities are orthogonal. That's the way you express it, right? I think they're not. I think there are pathways between, this, between these islands. And I don't see how ADD helps you to tie architectural de decisions to use cases from the application domain. Uh, right. In particular, what do you do when the change is in the application domain that has so much influence on the architecture that you have to scratch it? That you have, to, I'm not talking about extending a design. Yeah, of course, when you see a lot of spaghetti, then uh, these poor students will violate anything to, because they can see 
the the one noodle that should have uh, been avoided, right? But how do you replace an existing architecture with another one due to changes in the use cases, in the functional requirements? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so that's a great question. Thank you, Baron. Um, um, when I say orthogonal, I do not mean disconnected, right? So when we pose a scenario, it is almost always associated with the use case, right? So there's some use of the system. There's something that you want to do. The user presses the green button and, you know, some information appears on their, on their display. That's a use of the system. It's a function of the system. And then we might have a performance annotation of that. How quickly does that, that uh, dialog box appear? Or we might have a security annotation, you know, only authorized users are allowed to see that, or execute that particular function and see that particular display. Or it might have an availability annotation that says that this function works with uh, uh, seven nines probability something like that. So I, I do not mean to imply that use cases are somehow unimportant. Um, when I say orthogonal, I simply mean that I can change those decisions independent of each other. But clearly, you're, you're building the system not to be fast or robust, but to deliver the functionality to the users. And oh, by the way, do it quickly and, and robustly. So I... I um, hope I didn't mistakenly give that impression that I don't care about functionality. It's that the functionality does not drive the architectural decisions. What drives the architectural decisions are going to be the changes in, let's say, performance or availability requirements that those functions, that, that come along with those functional requirements. Yeah, I see that. But you start, I think you start as an architect, that means you start with a solution domain not with the application domain. And I, I, my, personally, I feel, uh, especially if you use something like the OZ model, uh, where you have analysis, not in the way you use the word analysis, analyzing, analyzing a design is one thing, but analyzing the application domain with, uh, you, we also use scenarios and use cases here. I don't still see the connectivity or the I see the two islands, yeah? the application domain expert, the banker or the meteorologist or whoever. And then I see you as a syntactic architect who says, oh, I have a reference architecture uh, cloud. And then they say, okay, well, now we use mobility and nobody uses computers anymore. We all use uh, smartphones. Yeah. Uh, I think then you cannot just use the cloud architecture, at least not as an extension. You have to start completely from scratch especially yeah. in IoT environments, right? Uh, so maybe yeah. you can address this concern. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, for sure that's a valid concern. And I think that you will see if you look at uh, the game and the game materials, or if you look at our design book and, and some of the case studies that we do there, that we do care, care very deeply about the functional requirements. And sometimes, yes, those functional requirements do shape the system in one way or another, uh, but they are not what we, what do I wanna say? Very few functional requirements are, are driving architectural decisions. It's uh, again, I, I wanna distinguish between what I call an architectural driver and something that is important, right? It's clearly important that you meet the, the, the use cases, and especially the primary use cases of the system. But um, the example that you gave, well, I want my system to be able to port easily to a different environment, you know, on uh, uh, smaller battery powered devices. Um, that has, clearly, that has architectural, profound architectural implications. And, and you could ask yourself as an architect, do I want to um, design for that eventuality in advance? And so, you know, abstract away the, the, the device characteristics or abstract away the display characteristics or those kinds of things, or do I not, right? Each of those leads you down a different architectural path. So you need to collect those requirements and, and we do so 
um, sometimes we do so in something that we call a quality attribute workshop, where we do a lot of scenario brainstorming and we're collecting both these functional requirements and their quality attribute annotations or prioritizing them. But sometimes uh, we're dealing with more traditional requirements documents with use cases, purely functional, and then we're trying to add uh, architectural requirements, quality attribute requirements to those. I don't know if I've satisfactorily <laughs> answered your question, but well, I uh, I think I I should let somebody else ask you one question. I have more. Maybe I'll get back uh, if there's no other ones. Or we have still a nanosecond at the end. I will ask another question. But how about yeah. somebody else jumping in right now? But sure. thanks again uh, for your talk and also for your first iterations of on my questions. <laughs> Welcome. So are there more questions out there? In the meantime, you talked a bit about abstraction and uh, that abstraction, or that students typically don't like abstraction. And uh, what I experienced in a requirements engineering course is that students seem to not like the idea that there are multiple abstractions that may be correct, so that they often want the one correct solution. And uh, I was wondering whether you think that your game can help in their students understanding this. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, that's one of the things that we talked about a little bit yesterday when we did the, the session on the game in the ASEET. Uh, session is that each iteration of the game, each round, there does a, there's a design goal and you're presented with a bunch of options that you can choose. And none of the options are obviously wrong, right? There's only a little bit better and a little bit worse. And so the students are free to make any choice that they want, but then you assign a score to that choice. And as I said, this becomes an opportunity for a discussion. So we don't see the game as freestanding. The game is a pedagogical device where the score is the entry point to say, you know, why did, did uh, Ernie get seven points on this iteration and Mary got eight points, right? Well, Mary made a better decision because dot, 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 dot. And, and that becomes, uh, yeah, a teachable moment in the game. And, and scores are really crucial and you don't have scores in the real world, right? So it's, it's clearly an artificial device, a pedagogical device, but one that we think is, is really important in kind of lessening the barrier to understanding how you make choices and that those choices have consequences. Right. If I, if I may, um, one of the things that I that that really appeals to me about this is that um, you're you're putting in black and white, and you're making obvious um, the the value, the relative value for the individual choices that there are. And one of the things that I'm struggling with in my in my project based courses is that I'm trying to instill this feeling in students that sometimes a suboptimal solution might be preferable because of other factors that might might be covered i mean that of, of course makes it then the more optimal solution by some stand by some definition of the word optimal but um saying okay listen only because you're more more um uh have more experience with kubernetes that's, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that this is what you should use because, you know, the, the project requires something else. Yeah. I, I do an exercise quite often with my students on um, eliciting and prioritizing architectural requirements. So what I'll do is I will pretend to be a, a, a project manager. And I'll put on my project manager hat and I will give a presentation to the class about here's the system that we're going to build and here's why we're building it. And it's really important for the success of our business and it's got to have these features and functions and yada, yada. And then I give a second presentation, putting on my architect hat and I talk about the context for the system and the technical constraints of the system and maybe some quality attributes that I think the system's going to have to um, 
exhibit. And then I say to the students, okay, write down what you think the drivers of this system are in terms of the quality attributes. You know, those words like performance and maintainability and, and availability and testability and usability and, and all those words. And, and I say, you know, it doesn't matter that we don't have perfect understanding of what those words mean. Just write them down. What do you think are the most important drivers for this system and their priority? And they do this and it has never happened that two groups have come up with the same list in a class and in all my years of teaching and, and doing this exercise. So then it becomes a discussion question. Why did you get, you, you, you all saw the same slides that I presented. You all heard the same words that came out of my mouth and you, you came up with different drivers in, in different orders, different prioritization. Why is that? And the answer is kind of related to the, the Kubernetes comment is people are making decisions based on their experience, their prejudices, their biases. And that's what hurts. Uh, that's what threatens repeatability and discipline, engineering discipline. So, you know, I always bring that then back to a method. A method gives you a set of steps to follow so that your personality, your preferences are, you can't eliminate them ever, but are less dominating in the discussion, right? There's a process that you have to go through and that tries to give you some, some more intellectual rigor to the process if, uh, to, and, and hence to the outcomes. Other questions? So on the chat, there's some discussion involving Rüdiger. I don't know if Rüdiger, you just have a question for Rick also. Well, it was um, <clears throat> just a reaction <laughs> regarding the discussion about what is the optimal solution. In a highly innovative environment, you usually have a high degree of uncertainty. Yes. And then there's a lean method called set phase design where you use a design space exploration to find out what, what are the close to optimal solutions. And then you go on into the next detailing step with a set of possible solutions. And finally, you find the, the right one. It needs uh, more front loading, but uh, reduces the risk that you have to go back to the beginning and lose maybe many years of development. <laughs> so one of the things that I emphasize when I'm teaching architectural design is that most architectural design is not novel that yes, occasionally you have to build an unprecedented system, but most people, most of the time are building precedented systems, right? They're building another accounting information system. They're building another transaction management something. They're building another e-commerce web store. And that's most of what software is in, in the real world. And if that's the case, you should be reusing designs as much as possible, reusing proven solutions or design fragments, proven solutions as much as possible. And if you're out there and you know, near the edge of insanity, as you're talking about doing something that's truly innovative and really pushing the boundaries of, of what's possible, that's different. And that's not the, um, I don't think that's where a method gives you as much leverage. That's where you really have to be uh, creative and innovative. It's a different skill set. I completely agree that uh, most development is based on the history. We call it brownfield developments. And also in our company, I always say it's about 80% is brownfield. Yeah. Only if a few developments are greenfield where you start from scratch, something completely new. <laughs> And yeah, you have yeah. the full freedom. And in the brownfield environment, of course, you use experience, but sometimes there may be a disruption in technology. If you go from a maybe gasoline driven car into a, an e car environment, uh, first you need a motor and a brake for acceleration and deceleration, but an, an e motor could do both. Uh, so if you step back, you might, might find more integrated and uh, improved steps. And if you keep doing always the same thing as a group developing the motors and the other one developing the, the brakes and they never will change. <laughs> Sometimes you have to step back and think new. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. M my point is that, and, and I think we agree that most design isn't like that. And that when you are doing that new stuff, 
you are in a different space in terms of cost and risk and, and predictability. Um, the example I love is that the Sydney Opera House was delivered about 10 years late and uh, almost 14 times over budget, 14 times over budget. Right. Ask, they, ask us about the new Berlin airport, which has <laughs> just recently been like a couple of days ago, been opened. Okay. Also innovative architecture. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it partly was by reusing the old technology, which was not adequate anymore. Ah, okay. Different, <laughs> different kind of mistake. Actually, some people yeah. say the Berlin airport was open just for the Giga factory that uh, Musk is now opening in Green Heide. Uh, <laughs> there is high tech and new technology going on. Uh, maybe also one comment to the discussion Dan started regarding what are the decision drivers. Of course, the, the functional requirements are the first drivers to come up. What is the, the possible set of um, solutions which you have? What is the design space? But then if you have a lot of alternatives, then the qualities come in and drive the decisions of these alternatives. Yeah? I always say in, in my courses, uh, functionality, uh, functional requirements describe what the system does and the qualities, how good they work. Right. And, so and, and, uh, important stuff. <laughs> if I want a system that is robust to failures of individual components, mm. I need some way to identify a fault, to, to even know that a fault has happened. Right, I need to do heartbeat or monitor or ping echo or, or exception detection or something to even know that something bad happened. Then I need to have some way of repairing that fault. And so maybe I have a hot spare or maybe I have a warm spare or maybe I try and uh, uh, do an exception repair or retry or something like that. And then I, I might want to put something in my architecture about preventing, proactively preventing mistakes. So we'll do self-test or we'll do um, uh, smart, smart pointers or, you know, blah, blah, blah. I haven't said anything about what the system does, right? All I said is it's a something system that we want to have highly high availability. And all of a sudden we're talking about architecture right, and architectural principles and architectural concepts and architectural uh, responsibilities. So um, if you want to build a high availability system and you forget about all that stuff until you've, you, you've already built it and now you say, okay, let's, let's duct tape on some high availability, you're unlikely to do it very well. Uh, it's gonna be very costly and, and probably uh, uh, heavily underperforming. Right. So again, this is why I say that it's the qualities that have to drive the design. And what's my function? Well, whatever it is, I want it to be highly available. And, and none of these things that I talked about, like exception detection or exception prevention or retry or heartbeat, are going to get in the way of whatever the function of the system is. They're orthogonal. Mm -hmm. So I really do think that um, this is something that I try to drive home whenever I teach it, but, but it's natural, of course, to think first about your functions because that's why you're building a system in the end. You're building a system to, to make a user happy or productive or make money for a company or whatever. It's the functions that people pay for, but it's the, um, the qualities that, that keep them using the system or that cause them to abandon the system in, in frustration and hatred. Right. Think about any software tool you've ever used that crashes a lot. Right. Do you continue to use it? <laughs> it's like life's too short. I'm, I'm abandoning this piece of garbage or, or software that's, that's very inscrutable if they haven't thought about usability or that's very slow. They haven't thought about performance. It's a way to, to um, condemn your system to the dust heap or it can be even very expensive i was working as a system architect in public switching systems and our require reliability requirement was five nines and 99.999 percent availability in including software and hardware upgrades so we did hardware upgrades of the central processors in the running system 
while switching yeah. calls. Huh? Yeah. And that needed, needed a lot of concept. We, we spent a lot of work implementing this kind of reliability and there are different concepts for hardware and software and you have to think about that. <laughs> right. And again, think about how hard that would be yeah. to uh, 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 try and paste it on the system afterwards. I see in the chat, people are talking about bio breaks. So should we be wrapping up? <laughs> um, yeah, we are just a bit over time. But I think there's one last question out there for just a couple of minutes. So I would hand it over to Chris Taylor for the last question of the session. So I apologize. I wasn't able to uh, attend your talk yesterday and this may have been covered there, but I'm, I'm curious what you do to try and help students get a, a visceral experience of what goes wrong. It, it, it's it, when it's just, oh, well, yeah, that's not as good as this. That's a much different experience than if they've actually tried to retrofit a system with a new quality attribute. Are, are there things that you do to try and, and help make that hit home in a more memorable way than just theoretical? Yeah, um, no, it's a great idea, but I, I haven't really done that. Um, I've mostly been focused on, it, it's hard enough just to teach design. Uh, and, and I kind of spend all my time trying to convince people, but first teach the methods and the tools and the techniques and then convince them why these are the right things to do. Uh, so it, it's a great idea. It's, it, uh, it's costly in terms of time in course, you know, time in, um, in, in lectures and, and assignments and stuff. But um, yeah, I'd be interested to chat with you about, uh, about that if you have some ideas, because I think it's a great idea. Yeah, thank you once again, very, very much. We were very happy to have you here. Very happy to your talk. Your talk. Um, we enjoyed it very much. Um, we uh, wish you a good night. <laughs> and uh, um, I will hand over to Andreas uh, Bolin, who is chairing the next session. And I think he will announce that it okay. starts two to three minutes later. Yes, perfect. So thanks a lot. Uh, so please stay tuned. Uh, we will have uh, five great presentations and discussions. Uh, and uh, I, I would also vote for a short break. I just wrote to the chat that we will be starting uh, at 11.45, so uh, in about three minutes. Uh, hope to see you and hear you then. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. you.
Well, okay. So it's 11.45 and uh, I'm really honored to uh, chair the next session uh, with the title Project-Based Learning. We uh, do have five uh, papers uh, and short papers in that session. And uh, well, I was preparing myself for the session, uh, preparing a time schedule so you can see uh, Perfect, okay, you don't, ah, nice, because it's the background. So I prepared a perfect plan with the schedule. And uh, well, uh, I keep it as I'm uh, telling to my students, uh, planning is everything, but pl plans are nothing. So I can throw it away right now. I, I think we have about uh, 14 to 15 mi minutes now uh, per uh, presentation. And the first presenter will be Markus Borg uh, uh, talking about making programming lab sessions mandatory on student work distribution in a gamified project course on market-driven software engineering. And we do have two discussants, uh, Oyster Nitro and Anguin Duke. And uh, I see all of you online, perfect. So uh, I would say, Markus, uh, the floor is yours and you can start uh, with the short teaser. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So will you share the teaser or is that for me to do that? Um, I, I thought that you will be doing that, but uh, da, 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 da. if you can't, I can do that, of course. Yeah, I can do it as well. Okay, then please do that. I will just find it here. Right. So hello, everyone from a chilly Sweden. I just checked the weather in Honolulu. It's quite different here. It's really cold where I'm sitting right now. Uh, my house has not really adapted to the outside conditions it's turned cold tonight uh, let's see pitch this should be the one so let's see if i have the permission to share my screen let's see let's see yes exactly Seems it works right Yes, perfect. Yeah, good. So please start. Yeah, I will start. So hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Borg. I'm an adjunct lecturer at Lund University uh, in Sweden. And this means I spend most of my time elsewhere, actually. So I return to the Department of Computer Science once per year to uh, teach this course on software engineering because I like it, uh, basically. And uh, the title, it's a long title. Thanks, Andreas, for uh, <laughs> saying what the title of the paper was. That's, um, yeah, it contains a lot of words there. Um, it's about the project-based course I've evolved over the last years. And groups are now developing a RoboCode robot. This is for a programming game and selling it on an open market to other groups. And each group purchases a team of robots and then competes in a tournament. So there is some gamification here as well, just like in the keynote. Uh, the background here is a project-based course with the groups of six students working together. Uh, they are mixed from um, two engineering programs. And after a change in one of the programs, half of the students are uh, considerably weaker at programming. And unfortunately, the novice programmers struggle uh, leading to, uh, well, unfair work distribution, as you see here, the first bullet, but also uh, limited learning, uh, of course. So uh, as I designed the uh, most recent intervention in the course, um, I tried to control as many factors as possible and measure the effects. And basically the intervention was what happens if we turn the supporting computer exercises into mandatory labs. And... Uh, yeah, now this moves from a, a teaser to a spoiler, I guess. Uh, because it turned out that the work distribution within the groups didn't, uh, didn't change. Um, negative results, one could say. The weaker students struggle even more after the change. Because now they also had to complete the labs. So they spent a lot of time on the labs and they didn't even have time to think much about the project work. And um, yeah, that was what I wanted to say. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the teaser and spoiler. Yes. Uh, now I would like to hand over the token to our discussants, uh, Oyster Nitro or Ang Nguyen Duke. 
Um, hello, it's nice hello. to be here, and this is interesting. Um, my, I'm Einstein talking. I don't really know if you can see me. Um, I presume that you're sitting somewhere. Um, uh, Marcus, uh, this was a very interesting approach, um, and it's quite impressive all the things that you managed to put into this. So it's uh, it's kind of hard to um, know where we want to ask the uh, most interesting questions. Um, uh, a kind of a challenge, um, you mentioned it on that last, last point, is that you have two groups of students and they obviously have very different experience and perhaps different background. And I was wondering who are the most ex experienced um, coders or developers of these students? Could you, could you say something about the, the, the effect of having so diverse groups of students and putting them together? Yeah, this is this is the main challenge with giving this course, and I guess this is quite common also for uh, introductory programming courses because some students come to the university and they are really good at it already, and some have never tried it at all. So this is not a unique problem for me, I guess. But uh, yeah, I have a mixed cohort of students here, so they come from two engineering programs. I think you can see my mouse pointer, right? Uh, I refer to them as the ICT group and the MGM group. So we have um, uh, first year students from an ICT program. So engineering students of um, uh, doing um, yeah, information and communication technology. And then we have those uh, generalists, engineering management students, uh, third year students, very mature students. It's the most prestigious engineering program at the, uh, at the faculty actually. So they tend to be um, well performing already um, and they have uh, of course matured a lot during the first three years at the uh, university and they have also taken one more programming course than the uh, ICT engineers uh, and this is uh, unfair in all uh, uh, from all perspectives and this is very unfortunate but this is what I have to deal with uh, until they have replanned the uh, ICT program, and that has been up for uh, discussions for years now. Uh, how do you compose groups? Are those or can they can they group by themselves, or they, mm. they group according to ambition and competence? Yeah, this is of course a design uh, decision. I have thought about a lot. Uh, I let them self organize. Uh, I have. Uh, tried uh, mixing groups before and always you get some groups with mixed um, uh, mixed students as well and this would perhaps uh, bring some uh, additional learning opportunities as well but it also brings a lot of conflicts so there are big differences in ambition and maturity within the two student groups so I let them self-organize and they tend to group uh, within the programs but do all groups have ICT students and management students no Oh, okay. No, they don't. Um, so the groups are... of six, and they tend to go with their friends. So they kind of balance ambition-wise uh, on their own. Okay, so they are, the groups are actually quite different in all aspects then? Yes, uh, they are. But they follow the same program, of course, and get the same, have the same yeah, grading uh, uh, activities in front of them when they group. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a challenge. Can I make a question? Please. Uh, my question is that what are the learning objectives of this course? Now mm -hmm. you have two different types of, of uh, groups of people over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they have the same learning objectives, obviously. I have a formal course plan that uh, both uh, uh, um, follow. Uh, learning objectives are to um, go from programming to software engineering uh, projects development, developing a project, a product together with other students, getting to see uh, yeah, the major phases of, of software engineering. And um, it's nothing unique and uh, extraordinary when it comes to the um, um, course goals here. I mean, it's a general introductory software engineering course with a big project. Do you, do you lecture? I lecture um, once a week, so it's seven lectures in total. Not much, okay. But uh, half of the uh, half of the effort for the students should be the um, the project work. Okay, we still do have time for questions or yeah. discussions. 
Yes. Tom, can I maybe... ask a question? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, because you offered the course for the first year uh, students and the third year in the MGM program, yes. does it mean that the technology gap is, is low, uh, I can say? I mean, the, the amount of IT knowledge is quite low because you offer at the first year. And mm. This is true, which means our project, what they actually develop, it's uh, quite limited. We're not talking about more than a handful of classes at the most. At the most. And um, um, yeah, many, many of these students still struggle with the basic programming concepts. Okay, so does it mean that in fact you focus more on the method, uh, on the sprint, and of the, 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 what you put in the figure one or, or the phases of the project, that's your main uh, learning goal or, or not? Yeah, I try to do it an end-to-end -end project so that I want them to see the different steps. So it's not like we only do the early parts and then skip implementation, if that was the question. They actually deliver something in the end that should be uh, executable and used at the competition at the last uh, lecture. Okay. Okay, uh, so there are two, now three more questions. Uh, first person I saw was Bernd Westphal, so please. Okay, thank you. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the evaluation results in the middle? So if I interpret the arrows and colors correctly, then things have been going down between 18 and 19 for the ICT people. Do you have any personal communication or um, not just yes, no feedback, but, but statements from students on the reasons? Yes. So there is quite a bit of that in uh, in the paper uh, and that's actually the um, so what you see in the middle here and where you see the colorful arrows this is the formal standardized course evaluation from uh, the university so this i have not designed but that is um, um it has also open uh, open uh, questions so there i get a lot of, of statements yes and then i had also what i think was quite interesting a retrospective as part of the uh, um uh, exam it's a take home exam we we use in this course so i had the same retrospective analysis as part of the exam uh, both 2018 and 2019 and i could uh, compare the um, um the qualitative uh, responses there, of course, and, and check what they said. So, yeah, um, you can see okay. here also a little bit, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, we should speed up a bit, so we yeah. have two more questions. Uh, so I'm on Slack can... as well. Okay, great. Uh, so Gerhard Müller uh, was the next one raising the hand. Uh, you still do have your question or? Gerhard, so we can't hear you. No question uh, at all. Okay, and then I have Yari, Yari Poras. Uh, maybe you can post your question. Half a minute left. Yes, uh, thank you. I watched your video and in the video you were emphasizing uh, in the end of that, the, the market driven part where the teams are kind of, when they are doing these things, then they are selling those things to the others. Uh, how is that thing working? Yeah, that's what I think is interesting here. So I really wanted to have someone that cares about the deliverables. And the best way, I think, is to uh, bring in another student group uh, to actually buy, buy the robot. So uh, each group develops a robot. They don't compete with their own robots. They sell it to another group. So this is uh, kind of the... Uh, the major difference here. Is it always one-to-one -one fight or how do they, they kind of, uh, if they have five robots that they need to have, mm -hmm. do they have somehow, they need to optimize certain certain parts? Exactly, good question. Uh, no, uh, they we have one bespoke uh, customer in the beginning. So we set up those one-to-one -one mappings uh, relations first. And then in the end, we also open up uh, the market to let uh, other groups buy the same robots. And there they can do price setting and uh, try to... Uh, um, yeah, sell, maximize uh, profit, basically, sell to other groups. 
Okay. Okay, perfect. So thanks again for uh, the short teaser. Thank you for the very interesting questions and your answer. Uh, let me now move uh, on to the next teaser uh, given by, I think, Anne Jugend Duk uh, and uh, Oyster Nitro. And uh, maybe you can start uh, sharing your teaser. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Bulim, for the introduction. So uh, I will start uh, sharing my screen and uh, okay, I, I present uh, briefly uh, one to what we have done done in the paper. So just let me know if you cannot hear or see the, the screen. Yeah. Uh, so the paper entitled Undrained Students Are Not uh, Most of Freedoms and Experience from a Project-Based Software Engineering Course. So the, uh, this reflects our teaching experience in two instances of the course uh, project-based uh, at the NTNU in Norway uh, when I was there. And uh, the paper was uh, written by the main author, Einstein Nitra, and uh, as an associate professor at NTNU. And uh, I'm with Dutch, so now I'm working in another university, southern Norway. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we, we had the motivation to to compare uh, to to con constantly change and improve the, the course uh, based on the student feedback. Uh, this is a large course. Uh, we have more than four hundred students, so teaching is always a challenge, and we always look for uh, improvements. Uh, we so I ran the first instance of the course uh, in 2016, and Einstein ran the second instance of the course. And here we provide a brief uh, overview of um, the commonality, but also the difference between the two instances of the course. Uh, we have uh, exactly the same uh, 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 intended learning outcome for students. Yeah. Uh, the major difference mindset is that the first one, uh, when I run the course, uh, we aim to be innovative. Uh, we want that uh, every student as an innovators and we try to involve them into different uh, uh, creative and, and innovative activities. Why in the second one is the nobody, uh, 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 nobody left behind uh, approach where we try to, at Ostai was uh, the main teacher and uh, we try to give uh, as much guidance as possible and try to uh, make um, the, the best learning outcome to every single student in the class. Yeah. And uh, we, we find, uh, we have both data, uh, quantitative and qualitative. And uh, we find, uh, we investigate uh, the difference in terms of the dimensions of the course. Uh, and the extent uh, to what uh, it can be flexible or it can, it can be free. Uh, and uh, we see, uh, we, we try to, to see what is the best uh, balance uh, between the um, combination of these uh, uh, dimensions. Yeah. yeah, so for the detail of the results, maybe you can uh, look uh, in uh, our phone uh, video uh, presenting the paper or you can also read from our paper. Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, in the second uh, presentation, the discussant is Yari Porras, and uh, that's the reason why I hand over the token to Yari, please. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions uh, concerning this paper. To me, uh, when I was reading this paper and looking at the results, it was I kind of felt that, that you had totally two different kinds of course, or two, two totally different courses, if I'm considering what you are teaching there. And as such, even though that you said that the learning outcomes or the objectives were the same, can you elaborate a bit of the differences of these two courses that, that you had? Uh, yes, uh, uh, very good questions. Yeah, so yeah, uh, at least the, the intention was the, the, the same learning outcome because it's the same course. And uh, it's just a uh, different batches. And um, the, so we, we try to teach the fundamental software engineering or uh, giving um, overview of the different uh, engineering process. 
uh, practice. And uh, yeah, so, so we did not uh, really teach a particular uh, software engineering programs here. And uh, it is a project-based course. So we, we gave the students uh, particular projects and uh, it might be different the way that uh, the, the setting for the projects. Uh, the first ones we, we have uh, involving uh, the students they be innovative and they come up with the project themselves under our guidelines. And the second ones, uh, they are under more strict uh, instructions and, uh, and uh, the project has been given to them. And there are also a certain uh, uh, um, a fixed uh, dimension regarding to the project setting. Yeah. And uh, we also have the same uh, set of uh, lectures. Yeah. So I can see. I, I could maybe add to that. It's very strange. Yeah, uh, because the formal learning outcomes were, of course, the same. So everyone else believed that we were doing the same stuff, uh, which, of course, we were not. Um, but, uh, but the main thing is that both courses had uh, uh, quite good coverage of sort of all the theoretical content and uh, all the main learning expected outcomes within uh, a traditional software engineering course and I when we when we sort of look at this in in retrospect we can we haven't really tested and we would like to test that actually but we haven't done that uh, that the, the all the old students have the re kind of required theoretical um, software engineering, um, background. So, in a way, uh, our learning um, objectives were kind of not very high in this respect, but their experience and what they experienced as group and designers uh, was obviously quite different. So, in a way, yes, they, the courses were probably very different as experienced from the students. Okay, basic, basically what you say here in the learning, learning objectives, quite many of those are rather technical. Did you think about the, the uh, soft skills at all? My paper next will be about soft skills. So, so of course I'm, I'm interested in those, but kind of thinking that, uh, that uh, if every student is an innovator, that would probably emphasize more of this, this creative thinking and uh, this kind of uh, soft skills rather than the, the no student is left behind type of an approach that would probably emphasize more on the teamwork. Exactly. So uh, we were, but both approach, uh, approaches had very, uh, I can say something about the tradition. We, uh, in our study, computer science engineering study, uh, we do have lots of, teamwork throughout all parts of the study. And we teach the students, we teach the teaching assistants um, to collaborate, uh, develop soft skills. Uh, so this was of course a main issue, but we had two different objectives and, and we made that pretty clear to the students that in one, um, in one instance, they were supposed to be innovators, and in the other course, they were supposed to be collaborators. And I think that uh, so, yeah, it was an interesting experience, and an ex and uh, yeah, but we we could have been probably more more explicit about that. Uh, one more question from me, and then I yeah. leave others to do. Uh, the team sizes were pretty big. You had nine students per team. That's quite a lot. Can you elaborate that a bit? At least I, I read somewhere that there was nine, nine students per, per team. I think the average in the every student, no student left behind was six. Okay, that's that's much better because I was kind of thinking that that how to evaluate the, the freedom aspect that you are, are looking at if you have such many students per group. Um, I think that uh, the average yeah, is the average like four to six students per, uh, per team. Yeah, it's the yeah. same. And uh, I just have a small comment here in uh, our approach to uh, the innovators uh, for students. Uh, we also emphasized uh, the soft skill and uh, the teamwork uh, competencies. Yeah. And uh, we did it um, indirectly via uh, the by telling the team of the teaching assistants 
and uh, yeah, they 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 report us also not only about the, the technical progress of the students, but also how the teams working together. And uh, the idea was that uh, we want to give uh, we want to give the students uh, interesting. They should be uh, motivated by themselves, and and uh, they should uh, enjoy uh, when they working together in a team. Uh, we have something to support that. For example, like we we let a student like. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, I think uh, as I remember, they they arranged the team themselves, and uh, we created some uh, initial events in the beginnings, so to to boost the, the uh, engagement of students to the project. Thank you. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions or remarks? So if not, uh, just a, uh, hopefully a short question uh, by myself. Uh, when reading the paper, uh, it uh, was not clear to me whether you were repeating uh, the study then in the following years, because I think you are reporting on the cohorts in 2016 and 2017. And then in your outlook, uh, you are writing that future work in this area would uh, include a more thorough quantitative and qualitative analysis of individual student experience and outcome. Um, so uh, I was just wondering what, what happened in between. Uh, Did you take a closer look at the data? Uh, did you repeat the study? So I think that both courses run uh, one year after. Uh, so this mm -hmm. was in... Um, 2017 and 2018, isn't that right? Um, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, but um, so in 2019, mm -hmm. um, it okay. was, we didn't, we have, um, we are continuing this, uh, but we don't have results as of yet. Because mm -hmm. we had planned to do this, uh, like the third instance twice, and then everything changed. So we haven't gotten around to fix that. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Well, uh, I think no more questions left. And uh, thanks for the uh, presenters. And also thank you to Yari uh, for preparing some questions. And I think now uh, Yari will change the role uh, and will be presenting his uh, teaser. Uh, we are now starting with the third paper, uh, Impact of Real World Capstone Project in an Acquisition of soft skills among software engineering students, and the discussant is Marcus Borg. All right, thanks. Uh, and I'm, I still have to say that, that thank you for the previous uh, really nice paper. I, I really like the names of your, your, your courses or the themes of the courses that no one is left behind and so on. We have been doing quite a lot of, lot of hackathons and so on, and that is actually our slogan in those. All right, this paper that I'm presenting or what we have in this, this, uh, in this conference is about capstone projects. And what we have been seeing that uh, industry has uh, certain kind of needs. Of course, they have technological needs, you know, technical needs or hard skill needs, uh, whereas the academic training usually can, can answer those pretty well. But then there is also soft skills uh, that the industry needs, and you can usually find those from different kind of uh, job advertisements and so on. And what we saw was that there was uh, some kind of a, a gap between the soft skills and, and what we are doing. And in this particular paper, we looked at our capstone course, and we actually did some, some changes within our capstone course, uh, course in such a way that we, we introduced real customers uh, into those, those uh, practical works. This is the last year, last year project for the students, and and basically starts from the, the customer needs and, and ends to the uh, to the delivery of the product for the customers. And basically, the students did some uh, some some reports during this course, and then we had some thematic analysis of those reports and looked for the, the um, soft skills that they have been. Um, Receiving during this course, uh, we got some feedback from the industry, and also uh, we kind of mapped these things towards the literature and the uh, what has been been reported in the literature for for the needs of the industry in, in sense of soft skills. So this is basically the teaser. Uh, this is this is a I have to say that this is collaborate collaboration work with my my TA or my 
postdoc that is already working some other place. Uh, but we last year or during this uh, course, we worked together with these students and the, most of the details are in the papers as such, but I'm really ready to answer to your questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then Marcus, you prepared some questions. Yes, I, I did. I would actually like to share my screen as well. Uh, I will oh. try to do that now and then it will probably replace yours. Stop sharing here. Stop sharing. Oh, let's see. You can see my screen now, right? So I want to first just uh, motivate why I think this is uh, really an important topic to discuss. Uh, and um, my way of uh, doing that is uh, by saying that I'm on the board of a Swedish uh, trade organization called Swedsoft. And um, it is an organization that really works on lobbying, one could say influencing decision makers with a purpose to uh, strengthen Swedish competitiveness in the software industry. Education and research are parts of that. One thing we do is we run a biannual survey of the software industry in Sweden, and we commission that from the National Statistics Agency, so it's done properly to be representative. And one of the questions that we repeat there is that we ask the, uh, the companies uh, about their uh, expectations when they recruit developers. And one of the questions there is uh, regarding soft skills, or as we call it, then complementary skills and traits. So not the technical stuff, the rest. And this is uh, uh, the top list, but uh, is uh, considered very important and important. And you see analytical skills, creativity, self-leadership, uh, and then further down, organizational skills, leadership, networking skills. And uh, it is very important. It is considered very important by the respondents. And perhaps we can return to this list in a while because you have this list. This is one of the contributions of the paper. You uh, check the literature for what has been reported as important uh, for recruiting companies. And it's a long list and you have uh, designed your capstone course in a way that it actually supports a majority of those soft skills in this list. And this I think was a very nice read. You have different problem owners, as you said, or customers. Uh, public organizations like the city of Imatra and then small and large companies. And my first question here is then, did you see any, any patterns here regarding the soft skills acquired and the different customers? It's a good question. We did not analyze the data that way that we would have uh, kind of have, okay, yes, we do have the data for each customer and we could analyze that, but we didn't analyze that. And as such, we didn't actually look for the patterns. Uh, the, the, there is a certain set of, of skills that were, were definitely emphasized, uh, or actually the students reported that they got this while they were, were working with the real customers. And let me just explain shortly why we introduced the, the real customers into this course for the latest, or the latest reported uh, version of this course was that whenever the students have the possibility of setting their own projects, it's much easier to kind of change the requirements and, and needs based on what they are doing and at what time. But when they have a real customer, they need to be able to communicate with them. They need to be able to share things and they need to keep up with the, the requirements and the needs of the customer. And that was basically missing in the previous one. And that was also emphasizing some of the skills that we, we saw in this particular implementation. Yeah, okay, and... uh, Marcus, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I saw that Bastian raised his hand. Okay. Well, well, whenever you're ready, like, you know, go ahead, Marcus, if you have follow up. <laughs> I do have, uh, well, if this, if you have something related to this, please go ahead. Well, may, may, maybe because one of the, uh, it's, it's pertaining to a student motivation and how to engage with stakeholders, because one of the things that I'm noticing in a course that I, I'm teaching that is quite similar to this, um, and, and uh, so it's, I'm very happy you wrote about this because it means, you know, um, I'm not doing something, some terrible disservice to my students. So this is con confirming my suspicions. Thank you very much. But one of the my, my, my key um, issues that I find is that I'm having a really hard time motivating my students to actually keep in touch with the stakeholders. They're so getting, and it's not because they don't want to, it's more because they're just so busy of, on, on, you know, focusing on the project that like, hey, you know, maybe we should ask the stakeholder if that's what they really want. Think about that. Well, 
How big a team? How big a teams you have? Well, uh, um, th this particular course is, is a, between between 15 and 30 students, but they all work on the same project. So mm -hmm. they have different sub teams: one for requirements, one for GUI, one for database. That might be the reason because I don't have any sub teams. They, there is basically five to six students per, per topic, and then they basically have the roles for each people uh, working in the team. And as such, there might be somebody who takes, uh, and then I will figure it out pretty early in the course that who will be the, the project manager, who will be the responsible of things. And actually what they will do, they will sign a team contract where they are defining these things. I do that, yep. Mm. Okay, but you're assigning specifically, you're the, you're the project, I'm not you're the product owner. The team what do they do? Team oh. assigning. But I need to know those things, who is assigned so that who to blame if, if certain things are not happening. And then, of course, we are discussing with the customers as well that, that how well were the, the team actually communicating with the customers. But there is also the communication towards me. And yep. then there is the internal communication within the team. And, and the customers, are those, are those, are those role played or are you, you no, bringing them no. in from, from, a, from that, outside? The piece that is given over here, there is city of Imatra is a, a city next to us. The Sepia Games is a small gaming company. Astura Enzo is a big forest company. Uh, okay, that uh, Polytechnic Williams Club is a, uh, one part of the university or the university student union and asset therefore are two companies. Visma is a bigger company. Savox is, uh, mm. is also a company. They are real oh, companies. Okay. okay, Marcus, I don't Thank know you. how many... Uh, I would please. like to proceed to another one. Yes, yeah, this is interesting. But I, don't, uh, I don't know how many questions uh, you I have prepared. another one I think uh, would be good. There is ask. another question in the chat uh, by, given by Christopher. So it's uh, you decide how to proceed. I will proceed with the, my, my last question then, uh, and then we can see what, how much time it takes. Uh, let's look at the soft skills you, uh, you found here in the, in the paper then. Uh, that uh, you, uh, you did a thematic analysis of uh, student reports to see, yes. Yes. Um, to see the soft skills. So this is self-reported what they think they learned, kind of. This is self-reported, yes. Yep. Uh, we, we did ask for some of those things, uh, the, the customer perceptions as well. Uh, there are some here that I think stand out a bit, like conflict management was not on the list uh, in the literature, right? And uh, ability to work independently is also not on that list. It's more about teamwork, typically, when you're asking industry. This was actually, now comes my, my real question here. This is the list where you have uh, uh, the list on in the first column, and the second column is the same as I showed on the previous slide, uh, the frequency of uh, soft skills mentioned. So the question I have here is really, how would the table differ if you did this for a conventional product course, like perhaps the one I did uh, talk about in the first talk or in your other courses at the uh, university? Uh, probably there would be a, a bit different, uh, let's say, frequency of, of different things. The, having the, uh, the customers definitely increases this external communication that they need to be in touch with the customer. And also because they are internally doing things, they also need to, to be in touch with me uh, pretty actively and also to the TA. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, the customer orientation uh, probably a bit more than, than others, but uh, if, if I would compare this to the earlier implementations of this course, Yes, they, they need to do some team playing. They need to do maybe a bit more of critical thinking if they don't, uh, don't have a customer saying what is the thing, because first they need to kind of innovate what is the, the problem, unless I give them some. But three years back, basically they invented the problems and then started implementing that. So probably in those cases, uh, there would be a little bit uh, different uh, uh, frequencies of, of these things. Mm. But I think many of them would be quite the same, like team skills and uh, leadership. I mean, that would be expected also. If you I a... would probably have one paper in which we were looking at these things earlier, some years back, uh, one of my, my PhD students huh? did work on this thing. And then actually we compared what kind of skills we, we get in, in each, uh, uh, each course. Okay, that's 10 years back. But still, in that paper, 
we already had that kind of a comparison of what the university is teaching, what the industry is needing. That was basically a national national survey that was done, and then linked to that uh, the thing. And uh, okay, I have not compared that list to this, and that could probably be be one good thing to do. Sorry for that. Thank you, Jari. I'm, so I'm pretty okay. sure that, that all of these things are emphasized somehow in 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 different courses, maybe not as, as much as in this course. Okay, Andreas, I Hi, think thanks uh, a lot. you can take well, one. Well, well, so there, there, there is this one question in the chat uh, from Christopher. Are there grades attached to keeping in touch with the stakeholder, Yavi? Yes, there is. In our evaluation form, where is that? I'm just... Uh, we have not reported that, but there was a, a certain element that we had in our grading scheme in which we had also the grade of this external communication. External communication means both to the, to the customer and, and towards the, the uh, supervisors of this course. And we also asked the, the customer's perception to this communication, the quality, frequency, and so on of these things. But I also have to say that in some case, uh, one of those companies was uh, quite a small company and the team definitely suffered because the company didn't have time to arrange these meetings. Mm -hmm. I tried to be in every meeting uh, possible together with the team in such a way that I was following what is happening there and, and how they are handling these things. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you also to Marcus uh, for the perfect preparation of the questions and thank you to Yavi. Thanks, Marcus. Um, thank you. Coming to the next presentation given by Vincent Ribot, a scaling up a project-based SQL course and the discussant is Raphael Bruingel. So uh, Vincent, please do share your screen. And Bastian, sorry, uh, raising your hands. I, I didn't notice it. So excuse me, I didn't, I didn't see the importance of the teaser and I made it in a hurry. So I will present okay. two slides from the presentation. No problem at all. The floor well. is yours. Yeah. So the, 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 the idea of this, the paper is to compare a, a study made in 2015 with only 35 students, with a study made last year with uh, 21 and 20 students in the same class. And the idea was to have some materials to say that the former approach was better or not. And so my preconception was to, I will have a significant decrease in self-assessment. And so you can see for the result from this year, last year, I mean, so the students, they are very happy with, the, with themselves, I would say. And for instance, the first, the first competency is about design. Are you able to design and, and, and put a correct uh, um, create table and so on? And they believe they can, but in fact, they don't. And also they believe they can do some correct SQL queries, but in, in fact, they don't. And the only point they are more humble is that with they have to program some SQL in, in, in some traditional language, they, they, they are aware they fail um, because it doesn't work. So that's the first point that doing questionnaire and asking students for self-assessment is probably not very reliable. And then when you go to the help of education science, so I, I found the model of students' roles in, in the literature and I found it very clear and I was very happy with that and I used it from, from a while that the students have to be investigator, they have to be cooperator, they have to be clarifying actor, they have to be strategic users. But when I look on my observation, and it's, the new students, they do not investigate much. I mean, I'm talking about two uh, students that are in the second year at the university. And in fact, it's the first year in computer science because the first year is quite general. So they are 19 years old or 20 years old, but they do not investigate. 
just look at what the other do and do the same. And then cooperative learning. So really I do not have any control on cooperation and really I don't know what is happening in cooperation. And then the first role is clarification. But when I look at what the, 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 the students are, even they are agree or even they are fighting. That's the only way of clarification. And then the strategic user is what I, what I see is only they try and, and they try and they try. So, and so to conclude, that's what, what I regret is that um, when you go with a larger group with massive teaching, then there is a lot of conscious and unconscious plagiarism because and you have no way to 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 take time to discover it and to control it so that's it thank you very much okay thanks a lot uh, and now i hand over the microphone to rafael please thank you andreas uh, thank you vincent i hope you can hear me well it could be a bit louder but prob maybe, maybe that's a problem of my of my headset maybe now it's better a bit yes perfect uh yeah um thank you very much um for your teaser vincent uh i prepared a few questions because um it's quite interesting uh, you had a scaling up there uh, away from um, the original approach back to classical teaching um so it's quite a different of what we made um what we present in our paper um I like it because um, it's quite pragmatic. You deal with uh, three and a half times more students over the years. Um, so my first question is a bit out of topic. Um, can, you, can, can you tell us um, what are the reasons that there are so increased numbers of students over the years? Is it uh, explainable in any way? Is it just a trend? Vincent, please turn on your microphone. Yes. Okay, okay. perfect. So first is the demography. That's we are what we call the two. The, they are born in 2000 and it was a, um, a peak in demography at that time. And also, I guess that it came to, to the parents that uh, the computing area is, uh, is uh, offering many uh, employment. So the start and also probably we have a dual system in France that's very special that we have this school of engineering they are supposed to be more prestigious uh, leading to better career but now the people they are discovering that the university is doing well and so more students are entering in in, in such area Uh, have you some information on the distribution of male and female students in your course? Oh yes, that's that, that, that's the point. We have maybe 10 ten percent of female students, and as uh, observed everywhere, we have a decrease from uh, Western female students and an increase from uh, foreign female students. Thank you. Um, so now to my on-topic questions. Um, you described in your paper that you offer a library management software every year. Um, so this is quite a standard format in your course. Um, you also tell uh, that you have the fear that there is a lot of plagiarism or you know that there is a lot of plagiarism. Um, so I think this um, ever-repeating approach uh, forces this quite a bit. Have you tried um, in the five years uh, you report uh, some some kind of small changes to detect plagiarism? Small changes on the requirements? The plagiarism is not between one year and another year because I change sufficiently things uh, from one year to another. I guess the, the better way to avoid plagiarism is what uh, in the previous talk, uh, uh, was promoted is to give some freedom to students. First, they will have a slightly different system from the other. So it prevents uh, other students to, to pledge to repeat or to, to copy the code of 
the other because it doesn't work. And also giving freedom, give more commitment to the project. But when we, you are with large group, you cannot afford the task of assessing correctly, let's see, 80 different projects. That's not possible. You can manage it when you have 20 projects, but you cannot more because even you have a teaching assistant, nobody is doing the same, and then you will have no guarantee about the fairness of the assessment. So I think um, also the evaluation is quite uh, tricky over the years because um, in our approach, we uh, are facing highly uh, different distribution of students. Um, there are big differences in, uh, in good students and bad students. And um, uh, how do you deal with that in your evaluation? Um, I think this is uh, quite a bit limiting there um, because you have a five years gap. Um, are there any strategies dealing that? The, in my opinion, the, the thing with the best way of uh, assess students is to do two assessment on the same deliverable. I mean, you take the design, for instance, you assess and probably you give a quite bad mark because that's the first time. And but when you offer a second chance to the students, it will be helpful for anybody, for the teacher and for the student, because you want to approve the mark. And so you will look at your your proposal and he will learn or she will learn. But again, you cannot do that when you have 120 students, you cannot yeah. afford this. And that's probably uh, the 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 thing we lose when we came back to a classical system it is what i call the hustle reader cycle it is the point where the students learn most and it is exactly related to to what said rick Kassman in, in about the sad story he told us if you remember he said that most students cannot recognize modularity mistakes but you can apply to any mistakes without external input and assistance. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess that's, that's, that's the point if you want to learn some tricky things like design or anything like this, the only way to learn it if you have a feedback and it is what we lose in when we return to a quite classical. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's answers to, to your question. This is a related. Uh, it's, it's definitely answered. Thank you. Um, a last question, if you allow it. Um, uh, you deal with uh, student groups of the size of two, am I right? Yes, yes. Because uh, so, it, if you go more, you increase the risk that somebody is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, that's the exact problem I see there. Um, but I think you also have this problem in uh, groups of two when you couple a good student with a bad student. Um, I think you also reported it in your paper as a concern. And um, do, you, don't, do you think it's no option in such an enlarged course to increase the group size to stay at the um, already introduced format? So maybe uh, you, have a, you have a scaling here of uh, three and a half uh, times uh, of the course. So um, did you think uh, when you um, scaled it up about increasing the group sizes to maybe four students? Uh, before the project was done individually, I have no intention to develop some cooperation skills or like this. I, I came to increase to two because I want to reduce the number of projects I have to assess. But some students want to do it by themselves alone. That's, you have always mm. students, they know they will, they will do better. Uh, they don't want to bother with uh, other students or things like this. But the point is um, what I will do if I was allowed to is to make some level group. I mean, for instance, my students are 
in six group, six groups of 20. That's, that's the way of we deal for the labs. And if I was allowed to, uh, I will do some level like you have, you can have in language uh, class, for instance, you know, I will do some less good students in a group and then better students and a group with very good student. So then in that case, I will reduce the risk to have an unbalanced pair in my group, if you see what I mean. Mm. And then for, for sure, I will have to mo module to have a modulation of the objectives. And that's where the, the, the things cannot go further because when you do that, the students, they ask to be assessed with the same grid. I mean, the good students, they still want to be assessed with the same grid as the, the less good students. And that's, that's unfair. I mean, and I, I cannot, I cannot will de deal with this problem. I see how I can arrange to have more balanced pair, but then I cannot, I cannot um, modify the assessment grid because mm -hmm. the students, they are, they are protesting. You understand what I mean? I do. Okay, okay, um, perfect. So that we are already at the end of uh, this slot. Uh, Raphael, a very short question or is it okay? I don't think it's very short, so I will ask it. Uh, <laughs> Maybe then probably then we, yeah, uh, let's do it in the it's chat the or, or offline. Okay, perfect. So then thanks again to Vincent and Raphael. And uh, now just let's change the roles. Uh, the last slot and last presentation uh, in that session is given by Raphael Bringle. And the discussant is Vincent Rebo. Okay, Raphael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen, my pitch slide here. So Perfect. I hope you can yes. see it. Yes, thanks. Yes, very good. Yeah. Um, so um, maybe I introduce myself. I'm not the lecturer here um, behind that. Uh, uh, approach. Uh, I'm one of the tutors uh, who served in the project here. Um, and in our paper, in our short paper, we uh, um, present a reframe teaching approach towards project based learning in a joint machine learning master course. So um, before there was no project based learning, there was just an end semester project w where small groups worked on a mini um, on a challenge. But uh, with the reframed uh, approach, we introduced mini projects in the expanse of uh, 30 hours per student of work with industrial partners. Um, and the big thing is it's on real world problems. Um, what is uh, quite beneficial in this approach is that the heterogeneity of the diverse master programs is addressed um, as the uh, projects um, offered to students are differentiated. So um, in regards to the master courses, medical informatics, practical and technical informatics and business informatics, um, you uh, offer um, uh, quite profound uh, shaped projects for their discipline. And um, yeah, we, uh, we offered uh, some, uh, some, some manuals uh, to, um, to, to, to uh, foster the initial training here. And um, we have a two-stage knowledge, knowledge transfer here uh, where knowledge is uh, transferred first to the students and uh, via the students to the regional economy, what was uh, one of the main points of the projects behind it. And um, one uh, specialty here is also that at the end of the semester there's a scientific conference like workshop uh, where students um, are reviewed and have to um, hand in revisions and presentations and present in front of uh, interested parties but also the uh, industrial partners here involved in the project <clears throat> and uh, what we uh, observed is an increased commitment here and self-identification in regards to the projects. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, um, the students also experience the whole um, 
uh, cross-industry uh, standard process uh, for data mining, um, which is uh, quite an important fact here. And um, one interesting thing is um, that uh, we could close some gaps in the lecturing um, because there's a current trend uh, regarding anomaly detection, what we were not aware of before. So that are the main points of the study. Okay, so and it also ends your teaser, uh, which means that I hand over the microphone to Vincent and to all the others, of course. Okay, Raphael, thanks you for the paper. Um, I really appreciate to go in the paper. Um, my, my first question is very naive question. When you are assigning different projects to different students groups, are you not achieving a de facto differentiation? Um, we uh, label the acquired many projects first. So we say these projects are rather for uh, business informatics and those are rather for medical informatics. So they have labels and we propose um, to choose um, a specific labeled project, uh, oh. specifically oh. labeled project here. Okay, thank you. Then I, um, if I resume your approach uh, that I think is very good. So they use uh, this CRISP for data mining uh, um, method, I will say. So you have, you have industrial partners, so you are building a network of partners. You face to the problem of the non-disclosure agreement relative to the, uh, what I will say, the reality of the data. That's, I guess, one of your main problems. Mm -hmm. And then you have manuals, you have working environments as Docker containers that will considerably simplify uh, the use of tools. You have the tutor gu guidance and you have the closing events. So that's really a complete uh, experience of learning for students. And my question is much more personal. So you tell us that you're working as a, a research assistant. And so you are doing this as extra or as part of your, your contract. But for you and for you, your colleague, how can you quantify the, the amount of time you take? So like, let's see, uh, uh, it's for during the summer, the summer, so it's last three months probably or something like this. What is the amount of times you devote yourself and your colleague to managing all these things? Um, so for me, it's, it's a lot. Um, to answer honestly, um, it's not um, that big deal of effort um, that these... Uh, these uh, tutor positions are uh, part-time. So my colleague worked uh, on a 50% basis and I just worked on a 25% basis. Um, that is not that much of effort when you prepared um, the manuals and the tools first. Um, um, including the preparation. The preparation was uh, quite some effort, but um, there is there is no much uh, overtime there. Okay, and so I, I I think that the the main problem, in my opinion, is the, this problem of of data, and you cannot uh, guarantee to the SMEs to your industrial partner that you will have a non-disclosure agreement, so they won't give you, I mean, your data, so you providing students with surrogate data. So do you have any idea you can do differently? Um, the mini projects themselves are not suitable um, for an NDA there. Um, that's a big point. Uh, so this is also a problem uh, because uh, we had to use surrogate data in so many cases. But um, when the projects are continued as a master thesis or master project thesis, um, a non-disclosure agreement is no problem. So um, this is the main point here um, to, to uh, allow students to continue the projects in a much bigger work. And uh, there um, is no such problem that you cannot um, 
set up a non-disclosure agreement. In fact, that's the main point um, to, um, to first let them work on a specific topic um, and then uh, get them to the real data, to the big problems. Okay. I have a few questions, but I prefer to give the, some question to the audience if they have. So up to now, there is nothing in the chat, but uh, yeah. So are there any questions or comments? So if I have, some, do we have some time? You do still have some minutes, yes. Some minutes, okay. Yeah. Four minutes about. So in my opinion, so you are doing two, two things in with the same, with, with your, your, your project, because what we call in France, we call is uh, uh, making uh, with a stone two play, but I look at the, the translation is kill two birds with one stone, <laughs> what you, you are doing. I guess that you are doing well your, your, your ML project for very differentious population, but I guess that you are also building a network of industrial partner that you, you're really starting to, to have a lot of people. And then uh, if I see your result, you have eight, about eight students, they want to pursue the machine learning things in the master thesis. And that's a very big result. I mean, doing that, building the network and having students committed to this, I guess that's a result that do not appear in your paper, but that is present in my opinion. I'm true that you are killing two birds with the same stone. Um, that's quite the right metaphor here. Um, yes, uh, we reported that there are some students um, that have um, now more interest and fun in the topic, in the overall topic of machine learning. And um, I don't have the actual numbers right now, how it was in the prior years, but I think this rate of um, um, students that would like to commit their thesis uh, to machine learning has increased too. Um, we kill two birds with one stone here. Yes, you're right. Um, because we um, can also place students in SMEs. That occurred quite sometimes, not, not in every ca case, of course, and that's not the aim, but um, one aim is to also strengthen the regional um, industry here that is not, not very familiar with machine learning methods yet. Mm -hmm. I see. So for me, that's good. And uh, I really thank you for your paper again. Thank you for your discussion. Okay, thank you for uh, your questions and also the answers. Uh, maybe I can uh, just conclude with uh, a final question, a bit more technical question. Uh, in your paper, you were talking about um, raising the final score share uh, to 30% to improve the commitment to the course. Uh, why 30%? Uh, is there any rationale behind? Um. The reason behind that is um, a comment in the evaluation of one student and uh, some oral comments received after the okay. workshop. Um, in fact, the students worked way more than 30 hours mm -hmm. that were originally planned um, okay. on the project. And that is, um, of course, the reason to say, well, let's share, um, uh, let's, let's raise the share here and okay. uh, increased commitment because we saw in some cases that students um, said that's too much work for two less uh, results. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay, that's okay. That, that sounds reasonable to me. So uh, in the paper I just read, it was one comment. And uh, well, uh, usually also at our university, you know, so we do have these feedback systems and uh, those who are not satisfied, they uh, write the comment uh, into that system, but those who are satisfied don't write anything. 
And uh, so there might have been a bias, but uh, that sounds very reasonable for me. Okay, so thanks a lot and thanks again. Um, lunchtime is ahead of us, uh, but before we are going into the break, uh, let us applaud all the presenters and the discussants uh, for preparing <laughs> for this session. So thanks a lot. And um, yeah, so there is now one hour break, uh, lunch break, uh, and uh, you're all invited to join them the next uh, main session, which has the title Studious. Uh, yeah, hope to see you again. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. session, everyone. Thank you much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Andreas, for starting late, but uh, ending sharp. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Very good session. <laughs> OK, so now audio is, is, is on again. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I, I had 14 minutes now for everybody in the slot. And uh, yeah, as you, as you